audiobook title Gate Journey in the New World, 00-37, by Dom2040 Part 04. This work belongs to author Dom2040, source scribblehub.com. Even though she wasn't in the mood for snacks, the young mage smiled slightly and eventually accepted her offer and took a bite that she will never regret. Meanwhile, the chatters amongst the coalition officials filled the room once more, discussing the threats and opportunities of the current situation at hand. General Wilkes then nodded in understanding. Thank you, Mr. Cato. The American general said, flashing a small smile. We appreciate the information you have provided, and we'll see the best of what we can do in our power to help your home's situation. A sense of relief filled the old man's heart. He had no choice right now but to give his trust to the men in green and so far, they were willing to help him. He took a glance at the demigoddess, who in turn gave him a smile. You did great old man. He slightly cringed and could only just imagine the scenario of the young lady teasing him, and as he sat down, the latter herself automatically stood up knowing that it was finally her turn. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
as she slightly raised her hand as if to summon something from thin air. There was a slight burst of wind that flew past the coalition officers and headed towards the girl's hand. Moments later, a light suddenly flashed and blue ethereal energy appeared from thin air. Everybody except Lele and Kato, jaws dropped. The staff found themselves stunned at a sight they had never seen before. An actual summoning right in front of their eyes. From the energy that formed, a certain cute cat-like anthropomorphic being popped out and made his entrance. Rory, will you slow down with the summoning? The first thing Tara said, a full-blown whine and complain. Not aware of the situation he had entered in. The next thing he knew he saw the distinct smile of his master, followed by her comically smacking him on the back of his head. The cute spirit frowned before taking notice of the large group of humans, who were staring at him with surprise and puzzled looks. Oh, is this group that I am supposed to present? He wondered. As for the rest of the staff, they were still lost for words at the scene. Though some had already brought up their cameras in secret just to record the scene that belongs to the higher levels of the supernatural. They doubt no one would ever believe of this moment that easily. Oh um, hi. I am Tara by the way. The spirit nervously introduced himself but kept the smile. However, the awkward silence prevailed as the officials continued to stare at him. And fortunately soon. He realized the situation and proceeded to raise his small hands casting some kind of visual illusion on the air. Right before everyone's eyes they began to see moving images of places completely unknown and unfamiliar to them. The first image popped up revealing what appeared to be a thriving walled city. In the midst of the presentation, Rory cleared her throat. As you may all know, there are kingdoms and small states that still continue to resist the empire and its twisted philosophy, she said observing the moving imaginative imagery as well. One of the most important city-states that Sadera is desperately wanting to establish a connection with, the walled city of Italica. The coalition officers were impressed by the visual image in front of them. They kept wondering if those were actual footage of the city itself considering that every scene was lifelike or real life itself. To finally think that these sources were taken or based on memories of a person, as General Wilkes would simply describe it, a magical projector. So what can expect from this Italica, Ms. Rory? He then asked. The young lady smiled. Italica is a major economic and trading state located towards the north of the continent, she explained. Like I mentioned before, the city remains independent despite being close neighbors with the empire. She continued, their rules and way of life are different. Meaning, for years, the city's rulers have been attempting to make reforms for the better of its citizens. She took a slight deep breath recalling the last time she visited the place. And I believed you would get along with them very much since your world despises slavery. If I remember correctly, quietness befell for a few moments. Contrary to popular belief, most of these kingdoms had a slave system. It was surreal to discover that there is at least an independent state that does not follow the herd. So this Italica doesn't have a slave system or they don't have slaves, to begin with? General Wilkes asked, more curious than before. Rory flashed a sad smile. I'm afraid to inform you that the slavery system still plagues the city. Thanks to some nobles who remain steadfast in their stance to maintain it and advocate a merger with the empire, she explained, quickly changing her mood. And there is the other faction which is against the system and fortunately, are the ones currently governing the city. The visual illustration then began to change once more, showing an image of a charismatic man of great importance. Italica's ruler for more than two decades, Count Formal, had successfully ignored the system and implemented his own in secret from the opposition. She continued, Whenever there are slaves sold to the city, all of them would be treated equally and well as if they were not slaves, to the point that there are considered paid workers than pigs on the slaughterhouse. General Wilkes simply nodded, understood, but is the Count still governing the city? He asked. 
Rory sighed. I am afraid that he no longer is. As the last time I heard of him, he was encouraged to join an unknown expedition along with his trusted officials and hasn't returned since. She finished her sentence letting the men absorb the information. Then who is governing the city right as of this moment? I believe that would possibly be his youngest daughter if an event such as that transpires. Rory explained, giving a glimpse of her own concern. And what I worry about is the opposition surrounding her. There was a sense of worry that filled the eyes of the men. It is now possible that the recent ruler could be subjected as a puppet to this faction or worse a potential coup. Considering that most of the higher officials that supported the change and who were involved in the expedition were missing in action. General Wilkes could only sigh as the situation gradually became more complex. Thank you Ms. Rory, he then said. As the young lady was about to end her presentation, she suddenly recalled another piece of information. Oh, and I almost forgot to mention, she said, directing the Chirithi, to change the image as it shifted to a certain land where a specific group of demi-humans resided. I think you should all be aware of the warrior bunny tribes of the north. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
The young man noticed his emotions as he began to wonder how important this young queen was to him. Though, he did mention the latter being different from any royalty, as she was raised away from any lavish lifestyles. As moments passed by, the young chef-slash-soldier became even more interested in meeting the young forgotten queen, only that if she was still here living this living plane of existence. X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X. So you're saying that this warrior bunny tribe is still existing? Rory didn't hesitate and smiled. Yes, I believed a part of their once complete governing body had survived. She informed the coalition officials. Though, mostly they are currently hiding in secret or in forced exile. General Wilkes nodded in understanding. So where do you think is the place where this governing body is currently located? He then asked as all eyes turned to the young lady again. Rory took another sip of her hot tea. Aside from the Empire, where possibly the majority of the higher bunny warrior officials are held, I believe some had managed to flee towards the Principality during the waning years of the conflict, she explained, before adding. That is one of the reasons why I wanted to go with the envoy because I had a colleague there who was able to track one of them down. She finally dropped one of her secrets again. All eyebrows were raised in surprise. Cato expressed a puzzled look, wondering what the bunny warrior situation has to do with his friend. Never he had heard Rory being involved in that certain war or any conflicts between kingdoms. It has always been a part of her church's principles of not exactly participating in battles unless there was a reason. Thank you for the information again, Ms. Rory, one of the coalition officials said. But what kind of benefit can this tribe contribute to our goal? The young lady simply smiled. Oh, there's plenty of it, she said as she began to count her fingers. You may benefit them in espionage, assassination and master of sensing dark forces and, the list goes on. Another burst of silence filled the room once again. In the middle of that, Tara finally ended the magical image, which had been suspended in the air for a good amount of time now. Once he was done it with, he gave a huge sigh of tiredness with all the things he had to work on to project that certain memory. The coalition officials took the time to absorb the new information that the young lady had provided. Even several of the staff who were in charge of recording her everything she had said, were put into slight chaos of organizing every key detail of it. It was like one giant web of clues and newborn mysteries. For General Wilkes' part, the man could only sigh to himself, directing his pity to the intelligence division. Oh, they'll be going through one heck of a mess. He then shifted his eyes towards the young lady, who was now looking at him, as if she was waiting for his approval. Very well, Ms. Rory, your request is approved. He finally said which delighted the young lady. You'll be going with the team. With that said, the Apostle of Emeril gracefully clasped her hands together in a joyful and excited manner. Oh, heavens, thank you so much. I guarantee that this will benefit you and your objectives. As the meeting neared its end, Cato remained his focus on the girl, still baffled by the fact that she expressed her eagerness to head towards Quatoin. The old man did understand her reason for acting as a babysitter to Lele and her elf friend, who had their own specific goals although. There was something more to this than meets the eye. X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X all right, guys. The signal is up and running. This had to be one of the most awaited moments in their lives since going through the gate. The subtle change on a certain icon had almost caused Carl and Dennis to burst out in tears of joy. Not too long, a new screen popped up revealing a group of optimistic people, who were also eager to see them. Oh, how they missed the faces of their families and friends. Brian flashed a small smile before the other two had overtaken his place to greet the rest of them from the other side of the monitor. The calmer Wilson sighed, as he let the two younger men share a heartfelt reunion with their families. Hey you guys, I freaking missed you so much, Carl commented as a huge smile crept across his lips, staring into the screen, 
where it showed a familiar living room from their ancestral home. Hey mom, hey dad, it's been a while, how's are things going there so far? Dennis greeted. Oh, you don't have to ask, you boys are quite a celebrity here, Mr. Wilson said from the other side of the screen. I mean the whole town should be proud that the Wilsons are saving kidnapped people and fighting monsters from whatever that world is called beyond that giant door. Brian could only give a chuckle. I think I saw you two with Brian on TV. You were in this place called Genza, right? Mrs. Wilson then said. It's Ginza, Mom. And yes, it's in Japan. Brian nodded and replied this time, slightly giving a cringe. Oh yes, Japan. I remember now. Mrs. Wilson giggled. I can't believe they managed to hold a small parade just to enter that portal thing. She commented, genuinely surprised regarding that prior event. Oh, of all people, they still wanted to show the world how patriotic and glorious this can be. She sighed. It would be better if they worked in silence. Well, that's how they want it to be, Mom. Dennis spoke this time around. But at least I got to meet new people during that parade. He grinned recalling how he met those other fellow tankers. Especially the guys from that particular division. In the midst of the conversation, a certain young teen from the family made his entrance to the conversation. Hey guys, I heard it's a very cool place there. It was their cousin David, who shared his own thoughts. Have already found those giant slowpoke meat people? He fired the next question in just a matter of seconds. There was a brief moment of silence that followed as Brian expressed another sigh. No David, there are no giant naked people eating humans or an island with giant walls on it. The man boringly explained, before adding, This isn't that anime you're watching. It's not an anime, but a fanfiction. He cleared it up. That got adapted into an anime and movie because the author is awesome and did well towards the plot. He added, and it has a name you know. The teen slightly frowned, picking up a Blu-ray DVD of the said anime as he smiled looking at the title name, Freedom's Ring. Brian could only roll his eyes in response while his adoptive brother snickered behind him. Japanese culture was slowly creeping into the family after the incident. So by the way boys, when will you be coming home? Mr. Wilson then asked. The room fell silent once more as the three Wilsons each expressed their own uncertain expressions. Knowing that there was still work to be done as much as they wanted to be reunited with the rest of their families. As soon as they returned to base after the reconnaissance, Brian and Carl were assigned to a new mission while Dennis had his own tank platoon. I hate to break it to you guys, but we won't be coming home soon. The once joyful faces of their families quickly fell down, now realizing that they won't be able to celebrate the holidays together. And in the middle of that silence, a voice erupted from one of their walkies. Sir, the preparations at the gates are finally finished, and we kinda need you right now. X sex 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 So these are the specific places that we'll be going for once we push out of the region. General Hanzema stared at the large illustration of the supposed map of the whole continent shown on the screen. In fact, it was the most detailed the coalition has acquired from the locals and further improved so far. On the screen was a large map of the continent with various locations marked with circles. The smaller red circles represented the various camps and bases owned by the enemy, which had been meticulously tracked down with the assistance of locals over the previous weeks. The remaining states that avoided conquest and continued their resistance to the empire were represented by the medium-sized blue circles. Finally, the larger red circles highlighted the pivotal locations that had the potential to be the campaign's turning point. Italica, Rondel, Quatoin, and Sadera. The man muttered and mentioned the names of those places. Though he was well aware of the mission regarding the principality, he still had some questions left for the new ones on the list. Well... Italica is crucial since it is the closest thing to the main capital and a major economic trading partner. 
The blonde secretary explained adjusting her glasses as she pointed towards these places via a black stick used by the professors of old. Rondell, a holy city of knowledge as the empire is planning to use the city's resources for their innovation. She suddenly paused seeing the Japanese general raising his hand. Innovation? Meaning they are planning to upgrade their own arsenals? He said with a puzzled look in his eyes. General Wilkes cleared his throat. Apparently, several of our recon teams, including the last one that arrived had acquired what appeared to be three barrel muskets. Magical muskets, he explained. They are currently under examination and study, he added. General Hanzema raised both eyebrows in surprise. Muskets? I thought this empire was only in medieval and Roman stages. The man nodded in response. That's what we thought at first but the latest information and intel implies that these weapons came from another nation. He explained again. Not in this continent but across the seas and this empire trying to replicate their weapons, yet they needed the resources to do so. I suspect it was smuggled or came from a black market since that nation had an isolation policy at the moment. According to some military officials captured in one of the missions, magic is the main source they needed, he said, before adding. Fortunately, the empire doesn't have those mages or whatever you call it. He sighed. Moreover, this Rondell basically just wants to be left alone from any conquest or wars. I see. General Hanzema nodded before turning back towards the screen. So what else is new? The secretary took a deep breath. Do you remember the adventure guilds that you two had discussed in the last meeting? She asked while receiving a nod from the two. Well, good news. We got a lot who are willing to be guides for us but in one condition. She informed. Oh, what is it? General Wilkes asked, raising both of his eyebrows in surprise. The secretary gave him a small smile. They are willing to help us in exchange for food and medical supplies. She explained, most of their so-called parties, often arrived from their missions, with serious injuries and some guilds just couldn't provide the food to keep them going. She added, well, that's not a problem, we could help in that part. General Hanzema said this time, most of the personnel from the SDF were heavily involved in the humanitarian aid, while the offensive mostly goes to their American allies. I guess that issue is solved for now. A sigh came from the American general. So, how are the Anvu and escort team doing? The Japanese man then inquired. Preparations are done, they'll be leaving in an hour. His American counterpart replied again, along with the other teams as well. General Hanzema simply nodded. He didn't need to ask who was going to be assigned on that specific mission. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
The two men turned their attention towards Gino, who was able to give her own thought, as she finished loading a box of first aid kits to the back of the LAV. Both men just stared at the sassy young woman with an amused expression. Yeah right, Karada muttered while Higashi shrugged. Hopefully, there is a better reason, but on a brighter side, we could treat this as a free vacation of some sort. The man replied before adding, I mean the place we're heading off to looks like those cities we see in fantasy JRPGs. He flashed a slight excited smile. You know what that means? Shino could only sigh. That means you guys will take selfies everywhere until the point. It wears you already. She rolled her eyes as she finished the sentence for him, before going back to finish her remaining task. Well, fair enough. Karada casually shrugged. Yet deep down he was curious if there are also cat girls or any other beast men living in that certain place. Those Final Fantasy games really elevated his excitement. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
I kept her a favor for not telling you right away, but since you have been my friend for a very long time, I have to let a little bit of the information out. She added, It is also my own secret to tell. The wind grew stronger, as the old mage waited for her response, and tension slowly built in the air. The young lady simply looked straight towards his eyes and smirked. They finally figured out where the key is. X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X. Lele's eyes were glued to the scene of the giant green metal machines moving towards the giant iron gates. She, along with several villagers and a certain writer, had been observing the scene for a while now, and thoughts soon came into her mind. Why is there a huge number of them this time? The blue-haired teen asked, also noticing the combat and transport helicopters flying above them. They are pushing out of the region, Ms. Lele. Yuji informed the young teen. Our American allies wanted to end this supposed war and conquest of the empire as quickly as possible. He added. The girl then raised an eyebrow. Defeating a powerful empire like Sadera in just the span of months was quite an impossible feat at least to her eyes. Their territory expands throughout the lands and even to the former kingdoms, which were now a part of them. Furthermore, the empire itself had a huge number of soldiers, wyverns, ogres, and possibly even mages with dangerous intentions. They could be overwhelming for the men in green. Yuji just flashed a smile of confidence. Trust me, they know more than we do, he said as another group of tanks passed in front of them. Each of those tanks' gun tubes had a name written on it, symbolizing its heart and soul. While he was lost in his thoughts, he did catch a glimpse of the names, particularly that one tank with the initials HWGOA. Then in the middle of that moment, he heard the sounds of a horse heading in their direction. Both of them turned to their right, and the man's eyes were drawn to a familiar horse-drawn merchant wagon that had come to a stop directly in front of them. The wagon's rider stepped down a few moments later, revealing his identity. Memories would soon begin to flood his mind, going back to the first reconnaissance and meeting an unlikely fellow down the road, who helped give the recon team the right directions. Lele was utterly confused at the scenario. Seeing the shocked and surprised reaction of the man beside her towards a certain chubby and slick merchant. Excuse me, but who are you supposed to be? She gave a puzzled look and asked with a slight bluntness. In response, the huge man with blackish gray hair just laughed. Oh, quite the introduction, young lady. He spoke for the first time, before bringing his eyes towards the young man. And it's a pleasure to meet you once again, sir. He added, giving a slight bow. And my forgive my manners, I am just a humble merchant that happens to know the secret passage towards the principality. He introduced himself with a smile. You may refer to me as Duke for short. Soon realization came to the girl. And before she could speak, a certain Japanese lieutenant entered the scene. Duke San, glad you were able to arrive in time. Oh really? Itami came from behind the two as the man greeted the chubby merchant. Yeah, we're just about to leave the place, he informed. I suppose you've met Yuji and Lele? Oh, they are wonderful people, the man replied in delight. For Itami's part, the captain of third recon turned to the confused teen and as well as his surprised friend. Oh, I guess they haven't informed you guys yet, but he will be our guide in this mission. Guide? Both of them said in unison. Um, yes, he knows where the secret passage is located and he wasn't able to finish his sentence as the loud engines of the LAVs began to roar one by one, signaling the start of the mission. Itami forced a smile as he scratched the back of his head. Well, I'll explain it to you guys along the way, he said as he bid the two a brief farewell and returned to the location where the rest of the team was preparing. Yuji and Lele, on the other hand, continued to stare at the man with puzzled expressions, while the merchant smiled at them. I suppose another journey awaits us, he said as the last of the military vehicles drove away from the fort. Are you ready? XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
it would have concluded that there were no signs of the storm abating, leaving the sailors to whatever fate they may end up with. A massive wooden transport ship sailed across the raging seas, which appeared to be about to engulf the ship itself due to the massive waves. Fortunately for the crew of the ship, a portion of their prayers were answered when they discovered themselves still alive and breathing, trapped in an endless cycle of worry. The captain of the ship carefully observed his men, who were trying their best to maintain the ship from any possible damages. A hint of regret can be seen in his eyes as he formed his hand into a fist. He should have never accepted that offer in exchange for this errand, yet he really needed the money to help his family and maintain his livelihood. Not only he would benefit from the reward but for the rest of his crew as well. Captain? This is madness. A member of the crew immediately approaches the older man, his clothes soaking wet in rainwater, and a visible cut on his arm revealing a small portion of blood stains on his clothes. We barely can handle maintaining the ship, and that he was suddenly cut from his sentence when an unfamiliar roar from a creature was heard from the deep depths of the ship. The crew member stared towards the captain with visible fear in his eyes pleading for him to somehow stop whatever situation they had entered. The captain with a hardened face could only sympathize with him, knowing that the several crew members were risking their lives by just trying to tame and prevent it from wreaking havoc and destroying the entire ship. They should have been informed of the truth in the first place. He had no choice right now, and if he disobeyed orders or break the deal then he and the entire crew would face the worst consequence. His eyes slowly shifted towards a certain spot near the end of the upper deck and saw a cloaked figure standing and watching the raging waters of the sea itself. He felt a chill going down his spine when he laid his sight on it. He almost forgot that person was in charge of watching him and his crew and their ability to handle the situation until they reached their destination. Don't worry, in just a day we'll finally reach the place. All he could do was to assure the younger man that everything would be alright despite the complicated scenario that they were in. As the ship continued to traverse the storm with the intent of finishing its task. A certain task of delivering a beacon to the port. A port belonging to the noble city of Myhark, of the Quatoin Principality. Chapter End And well, this has to be the longest debut chapter for an arc though I don't know if I could surpass this in the future. Putting that aside, I believe the struggles of life had caught up to me hence I wasn't able to finish the chapter in time. Cue in the sudden disappearance of motivation, yet I am thankful that I was able to continue on writing whenever there is a spark. Anyways, regarding the chapter, I had to adjust the pacing a little bit since some readers pointed out that the previous chapters were slow. So I had to put a few time skips here and there just to keep up with the plot closer. Also would like to thank author DFMRCV for the ideas he shared for the chapter. So I tried my best to show the life inside the refugee town through the perspective of Tuka and as well as emphasizing the roles of the JSDF with them being more on the humanitarian side of things while their American allies focused more on dealing with the offensive and rescue of kidnapped civilians. Also, seen setting up these places which will the coalition head off to in the near future. Another thing is the guides, which I think could pose a benefit for the teams who are venturing to the unknown. I also did add little tributes in some scenes regarding a couple of certain great gate fix from the fandom. Lastly for this arc, it might be focused on just one place but I'm planning on changing the structure so that I could also show the other places such as Italica, Rondell, and Sad Era, even though these places are meant for the third arc. Furthermore, the last scene of this chapter is heavily tied to the main plot of the arc, as this is where Giselle's arc and the Qua Toyn arc converged. Hope that makes sense. Oh, I almost forgot, Tayo's second appearance. Pina's debut will be in the next chapters after this. With that said, thank you very much for spending time to read the chapter. I really appreciate it. I apologize for any grammar slash spelling mistakes since English is not my main language. Thank you so much and God bless. 16.
Arc 2, A Chaotic Household. Disclaimer. I don't own Gate or Nyankoku Shokan as it belongs to its rightful owners. Arc 2, A City, A Diplomacy A Dragon, A Chaotic Household. It seemed that the memory would finally stay with her forever. From time to time, it would come back to haunt her, and the moment when she recalled that fateful day, it would bring torture to her mind. She could feel the terrible dark atmosphere that befell her home and the gradual destruction that followed thereafter. You must leave this place, quickly. Please, don't leave us. Don't worry my dear, everything will be alright I promise you. She remembered running as fast she can along with what was left of her family. The fire spread everywhere, bodies falling one by one. The despair, desperation, and loss of hope had quickly emerged early. She was powerless to prevent a loss, a significant loss. She could hear the screams and her mother's final words as the massive flames arrived and engulfed her, never to be seen again, no matter how much she pleaded and prayed. Then a demonic roar was heard throughout the kingdom. A nightmare from the past had returned to greet her again. Milady, please wake up. Pina's eyes opened as she jolted up from an unexpected slumber. The heavy feeling had faded, replaced by a cool breeze in the air. Her vision cleared, and she saw daylight, revealing the location to be a park. A quite lovely park within the palace. Aside from her immediate surroundings, her attention was drawn to a familiar brown-haired lady and her worried expression. Hamilton? She softly muttered under her breath, briefly wondering if she entered a new dream, though that was not the case. Pina, where in heaven's name have you been? exclaimed the young lady, slowly forgetting the noble formalities. She asked, breathing a sigh of relief. I've been looking everywhere for you. The redhead kept her silent for a brief moment to think about what her friend had said to her. I thought you were in your room. In reality, she had been in her room for a long time before simply deciding to take a stroll through the palace gardens to release her impurities, finding herself on a specific bench before eventually falling asleep without her knowledge. She was still in a quite wobbly state, yet she rubbed her eyes and shook her head snapping herself back to reality. My apologies Hamilton, things are quite difficult for me these days, she finally replied, a hint of weariness in her voice. Tell me, what am I supposed to attend today? She said dumbfoundedly, as if not knowing what she planned on doing today. The young lady stared, perplexed. For a few moments, she wondered if her childhood friend was just pretending to be unconcerned about what was going to happen today. Though, she could detect a tinge of dissatisfaction with the meeting she was supposed to attend in a few minutes. She sighed in return. Milady, I know being with that, man in the same room can be insufferable. She explained, looking straight into her eyes. But you really have to attend the meeting. The girl clasped her hands together as she pleaded once more. It's really important. Quietness came back for a few moments as Pina's mind was overwhelmed with various thoughts once more. It was a battle between her own feelings and her mind. She was well aware of the consequences if she did not continue on with it. And from that, she was finally reminded again of what she was here for. She sighed back and gave a slight nod towards her friend. Fine, let's go. X X X X X X X X X X X X X X Duty was calling for her. Since that day, which ushered in a slew of new reforms ostensibly for the betterment of the system, the redhead has chosen to become a part of it, hoping to spread out her contributions to help her people in need while also elevating her status as a candidate for the throne as the competition grew tighter by the month. All throughout her life, she promised to herself that she would never let go of her main goal. It had been months since the empire had resumed its usual activities of conquest, sending armies to invade the small neighboring states near the borders of the principality. She stressed the fact that more blood would be shed if this continues on. Then, at last, the remnants of her old motivation came back, 
and soon she found herself walking along the corridors of the palace along with the brown-haired lady. Both of them dressed in their usual attires representing their group, yet they still kept a new level of simplicity to it. Ornamental designs and any fancy jewelry were not included, with only the symbol of her knight order embedded on their chest plates. She didn't want to be part of any so-called elite. In fact, there were never any elites in the Senate and court since the beginning. It was all just an egoistic illusion. The palace's corridors were filled with an unearthly silence. Aside from the newly installed paintings and statues of previous leaders and heroes, it brought no former glory other than an attempt to conceal its current actions with a forgotten memory of what her home used to be. So they are turning this area into a hall of heroes? She asked a hint of disgust in her tone of voice. Yes, milady, it's actually part of Premier Adam's plan to resurrect the old image of Sad Era, Hamilton informed, as if he wanted to remind everyone that whoever walks these halls shall have their hearts filled with love and passion to help their kingdom. Pina slightly smirked at the idea, fully dismissing it. Sounds unbelievable coming from a man who is not even Sadran of origin or descent, she commented letting out a tone of sarcasm and disbelief. Her father would feel pleased regarding these certain changes as of now. A wave of nostalgia had continued to engulf him, covering what appeared to be an unknown shadow of darkness and vengeance that lay dormant inside. Hamilton could only nod at the latter's words. She, too, was a witness to all of these changes. Dark changes shaped the empire into what it is now but it also helped her home get back on its feet. It was a difficult task to pretend that everything was fine on a daily basis, and she couldn't help but express her sadness about it. She looked around and noticed her friend walking down the corridor of lies, and they soon found themselves in a much more familiar area. The old cobbled walls and several windows that brought light into the wide hallway replaced the construction materials and wood. Hey, I remember this place, Hamilton said, a glimmer of excitement in her eyes. Pina nodded, a smile forming on her lips for the first time. I know, she said. The certain hallway where as a little girl, she used to play with her friends a game of hiding and seek, be it from noble background, and commoner background that would eventually become her companions in every adventure she partook as she grew up though sadly all simple memories had to end at some point. Seriously, Hamilton, inviting them to the castle was no joke. She felt a little embarrassed regarding the event. Growing up, she had a considerable amount of friends, who hailed from the outskirts of the palace, mostly that lived in the main city itself. They were the original ones before she was brought into another level of life. Friends, to which in the eyes of the other old nobles, commoners. I am aware of it, the page replied. Oh, those hours we spent trying to find each other had really tired me out. She added, but fortunately for your father, he had the patience and understanding, even though he is that busy all the time. The young lady kept silent at the mention of the man. She had no power of changing him back to the person he used to be the man with honor and full of hope of a better future. Hamilton watched her friend walk in silence as they left the corridor of lies and by the time they had reached the untouched places, they unexpectedly stumbled upon a certain person. Yet another silent hallway had greeted the two before they could reach the main meeting room. From a distance away, their attention shifted towards a figure standing at the end looking towards a window where the rays of the sun had penetrated. Both halted their tracks for several moments as the princess quickly recognized the white-haired woman. Isn't that? Hamilton trailed off her words, nearly raising her hand as a means to point at the person. For her part, she didn't know fully regarding the young woman's past other than the fact that she was often found in that specific spot. No one really knows, yet some say it was a spot where she could properly mourn the loss of her loved ones. Though for Pina, she knew the young woman's identity. She immediately turned to her companion and firmly stared at her. 
She gave a slight shook in the head silently telling her to not give in to any curiosities at this moment. Hamilton managed to control her curious side and took a deep breath to get herself further composed. Though she took one last glance at her, able to catch a glimpse of her face. She seemed so bothered. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
We can continue with this for the time being since there are no more major rebellions in the north threatening to interfere with us, he added, referring to a certain general from the Volgon territories, who mysteriously died under mysterious circumstances near the Alnus fields. Oh how idiotic Ruga was! Silence regained control for a brief moment before a subtle objection was raised. We could work with that sir. But I do have a concern and it is regarding Jim. An imperial officer said. Adam raised an eyebrow. What is it about Jim that makes you so concerned about it? His voice was tinged with sarcasm. As he didn't like it when people questioned his plans. The imperial officer then took a deep breath. The place is nothing but a quiet town. There's no reason for us to use such large forces to invade and occupy it. The man explained, letting out his own worry. In addition, they don't have military capabilities to defend themselves. He added, I suggest a show of force and negotiations would be a better move to claim the town without any possible resistance or conflict. Shedding blood and losing lives isn't going to be necessary for places such as this or is it? Once he finished his small explanation, the other imperial officers began to nod and agree with the man. His words reminded them of the recent actions committed by their own fellow soldiers. They too were witnesses to various inhuman acts and the questionable thirst for fresh blood. At that very moment, Adam bursts into eerie laughter which creeped out some of the men. Ah, it's been a while since I've heard those words. He commented in amusement as he stared at the man. All right, I'll honor that request, but you have to make sure that the town will be in our full control. He added, his voice growing menacingly. Is that understood? The rest of the imperial officials replied in unison. Yes, your excellency. Though at that moment too, the same imperial officer, who reported the concern regarding Alnus Hill, raised his hand. I apologize for bringing this up again, sir. But what should we do regarding Alnus Hill? Adam had remained silent once more yet he gave the young imperial official another intimidating smile. As if he knew what to do with the situation. It's simple. That scout of yours had been blinded by an unseen curse that he begins to see things that are not of the ordinary. He dismissed and replied to the official, who expressed a surprised and confused look. But sir, we don't have time for fairy tales boy. He cut the latter's words. We all know that Hill is cursed by the gods hence why. As he was about to continue his words, the door burst open revealing a familiar redhead. Ah, uh, Princess Pina and Miss Hamilton, I am glad you all are able to arrive on time. Everyone's focus had shifted towards the new arrival, something that the young lady subtly disliked and brought an uncomfortable feeling that she couldn't even comprehend. Though, putting those personal feelings aside, she took a deep breath and regained her composure. Adam, is there something you want to discuss? X sex 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 Walking out of the room was supposedly her last move to make. Hamilton secretly expressed her own discomfort regarding her surroundings as she took her seat along with her childhood friend near the meeting table. Her eyes keep glancing at the new additions placed inside the room. Day by day, she would step foot inside this meeting hall that drastic changes had begun to take place. It wasn't the simple yet majestic hall she remembered it to be. Various statues of unknown deities or beings were placed on every corner. On the walls were paintings depicting a powerful force emerging from the depths. Symbols she didn't recognize were also written near the statues and paintings. Finally, there was this small open cabinet displaying the man's accomplishments over the years as if he had brought a whole new culture and identity to her home. Goodness, even the way imperial officials dressed had changed, and it was all due to the man's strange ideas that she thought were rather contagious. Amongst all that, she could sense this unknown force slowly taking over the essence of the place itself. Her attention shifted towards her companion, who seemed to be in a much calmer mood than before. Though if it was genuine, she still suspected of her hiding a small feeling of distaste. P. 
Pina remained firm and calm, not allowing her attention to be distracted as she looked towards the man, who had now ruled the majority of her nation's affairs since the day he arrived. Previously, she had wondered why she was the only one present at this ostensibly secret meeting. The imperial officers who had been present before the room had quickly left, as if they were eager to complete their duties for one man's vision. Where were the others? Even her brothers were nowhere to be found at the moment. Can she still regret attending this meeting to which would eventually go nowhere? She was indeed too late. So, milady, how are things going with your campaign? The man finally spoke, as if he was concerned about the young woman's plight. I suppose a little cup of tea would help you enjoy telling your recent story about providing food and clothing for the slave workers. The man commented, amused. Or how about that heartfelt speech you gave to the families of the poor soldiers of the doomed expedition to the hill? Surely, those feats would capture a lot of their hearts by the time the day of the plebiscite begins. He smiled rubbing both of his hands together. Yet, the young lady wasn't impressed by his praises. I'm not here for stories, Adam. I want to get to the point. What do you want to tell me? She asked firmly reminding the man that she was not in the mood for tea or wine. Adam was unfazed by the girl's serious demeanor, yet he still decided to entertain her. Very well, my dear, although, I have to commend you for taking this seriously, he then said, resting himself on the chair once more. You remind me of your father now, when he still had the strength. Silence greeted him with only the girl still keeping the serious facade. He slightly sighed and cleared his throat. All right, I am assuming you've already heard of the reports of Quatoin destroying its own roads and bridges? He informed the girl. I am aware of it, she replied, before adding, and wholeheartedly I would blame your so-called conquest for causing this, and to which has blinded you all, and which has actually been foolish since the beginning. The man chuckled in return, ignoring her later words. Good, Adam said, pointing to the map, because the majority of the Senate, and I believe that we needed to maintain a peaceful presence, an image to our lovely neighboring countries like Quatoin. We're going to try a different approach and set up proper negotiations so no more blood is shed. Pina and Hamilton raised both of their eyebrows in slight surprise, yet still, they kept cautious. There was something amiss to it. With all due respect, Sir Adam, but what does this have to do with the princess? It was the brown-haired girl that spoke this time and objected. The man simply smiled. Well, aside from her being a good representative and symbol to the former neighboring states, which is also the reason why they surrendered unconditionally, he explained, glancing at the redhead. We also saw and recognized your role as one of the best negotiators during those events, he added praising the young page for her underappreciated achievements. We believe that it's time for us to send an envoy to the principality, and you too had been voted to lead the envoy and begin negotiations as soon as possible. As he was about to continue on, the young page raised her hand. Sir Adam, I am afraid we can't do it in a nick of time. She didn't hesitate to reply and protested. Milady has a lot of other matters to attend to in terms of yet she was cut once more. Then we already have an issue there Ms. Hamilton, Adam informed, directly staring at the girl's soul. You see in this day and age, time is of the essence, he said as he stood from his chair and began to walk to a table near the balcony along with his empty glass of wine. We can't afford any delays or else some kingdom or nation from across the Orient will try to establish a foothold here get the principality's affection. Pina raised an eyebrow. Why are they so eager to conquer that kingdom? Hamilton narrowed her eyes. What if we decline the task? She asked, feeling a bit confident to cross the line. By then the man grabbed the bottle of wine and poured a portion to the empty glass. And as the red liquid was flowing, he sinisterly smiled. Well, then we have no choice but to go with the original plan. He told both of them with delight in his voice. I'm sure you don't want that to happen, he asked. Both girls immediately felt a sense of horror followed by disbelief. 
Do you think threatening us with that kind of plan will entice us to join your cause? The young page stood up, prompting Pina to join her. How dare you! After what you've done by involving innocent people in your wars and sending 60,000 men to their deaths on a sacred place, and still have the... Though Hamilton felt the urge to protest and confront the man in a more aggressive manner, her childhood friend placed a hand on her shoulder and gave her a calm but serious look. Fortunately, the girl refrained from her words and controlled her temper. Pina took a deep breath, having heard enough of it. We accept the invitation but on one condition, she said, as her friend then turned to her with a surprised look. We get to also select the members of our Anva. A brief moment of quietness then followed. Instead of expressing a disappointed face, the man formed yet another smile. Very well, your request has been approved. Granted, he laughed and exclaimed, only to receive no blank reactions from the two ladies who are still in disbelief. But just make sure you'll be able to meet all the objectives once you are all there. I am now assuming that you are aware of the secret passages that would take you to your destination. The man was truly complex, and to their chagrin, they don't know how to comprehend someone like him. He was one of a kind, but he was also unbearably difficult to talk to. How did he gain his position as the emperor's most trusted advisor, and closest friend again. At that moment as well, knocks were then heard from the door, followed by itself opening as certain someone had entered the room. Everyone's attention shifted towards the newcomer in the form of a beautiful young servant. Ah, Noriko, what brings you at this beautiful hour? Adam greeted the lady with enthusiasm. From what he has heard regarding her that she is one of the best performing maids in the palace, and as well as the noble court, and also an oriental of descent. The servant kept quiet but subtly forced a smile. Um, they are waiting at the Senate Hall, your regent. She informed the latter. The man's eyes widened. Thank you. I'll be right there in minutes time. He clapped his hands together and said. Quietness returned once more as the girl bowed and left the room to focus on her other tasks, presumably. By then, his eyes looked towards the girls again. Well, I suppose we could come into a full understanding with this meeting, he said, finishing his wine as he placed it back on his desk. It's unfortunate that your brothers weren't able to be present due to their own campaigns, but I do hope they hear the wonderful news. He smiled in delight as he went to grab his coat. Again, I am looking forward to the day of the plebiscite. Such a wonderful idea, and that law your senators passed saved your family's legacy and this kingdom's free will. With that said, the man left the room to entertain his new visitors, but not before receiving a glare from Pina herself. Silence filled the atmosphere again, leaving the two ladies to deal with the new situation that they had gotten themselves into. Hamilton could only express a disappointed and regretful look as she was beginning to think that attending this meeting was a big mistake. She then looked to the princess, who was on her own thoughts as well. I should have listened to you, Pina. She solemnly told her childhood friend. That man is insane. The young page didn't hesitate to judge. The redhead sadly smiled, having no choice as of the moment, but kept the light of the situation at hand. She then stood up from her seat and beckoned the girl to follow. Let's go, we have a conflict to prevent. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
Norma Coiglu and Bozas Copalesti and a couple of members from a familiar fellow Imperial division. Both members continued to demonstrate their sword fighting abilities in the middle of a quite noisy background. Come on Norma, I know you can beat him. Let's go Bozas. Make sure you put him to the ground. It's time for the new generation of knights to take over. Everyone cheered for the two young knights. Some were slipping out necessary and unnecessary advice and some even managed to pull up jokes and subtle trash talks as a subtle distraction. As little immaturish as the rest of the members can get, the old imperial commander was still impressed by their support and loyalty to one another, as well as a fellow imperial captain whom he had previously mentored and was now a close acquaintance of him. I must say, I haven't seen this kind of dedication and passion in them. The imperial captain remarked as he watched a couple of his fellow men struggle to keep up with the energetic Rose Knights. And how much they have grown and improved in such a short period of time. If only they have the support, they'll achieve even more for our home. You truly are a one of a kind mentor, Sir Gray. The younger man finished his sentence with praise. In return, the older man chose to chuckle. Oh, it's not a huge deal, Darius, he said. If there is going to be one person responsible for their strong unity, then that would be the princess herself, he explained. It was unmistakably her who was responsible for the formation of this combined sisterhood and brotherhood, an idea born years ago and inspired her to restore the old honorable principles and beliefs of sad era from the twisted, and corrupted regime it has become. A promise she made to a certain loved one. The young captain nodded in understanding. I see. So she kept things intact in her group for so long that they treated themselves as if they were a family. He commented to himself, wishing the same for the groups he was assigned to. As it seemed every imperial group he has handled had a strange sense of fear to it. The men he had before and now, we're afraid of something that still remained a mystery to this day. So, I've heard the news of Marcus' demise, Grace said as the mood began to change. What happened in your previous mission? He expressed his curiosity and as well as his concern. What has become of him? A solemn expression filled the younger imperial captain's face. He killed himself by placing his own blood in some kind of explosion scroll blowing himself up and as well as involving the entire village he was residing in. Darius explained the story in the simplest way he could. Gray sighed and shook his head. Per soul. He secretly mourned the passing. A brilliant young man was sadly taken by his own declining sanity. Darius nodded in response, as he could only sympathize with his former mentor through silence. He also wanted to talk about the recent discoveries of mysterious symbols on the walls of the cabin where his old friend had stayed but decided against it because it would only complicate matters further. As an alternative move, he wasted no time changing the subject. Is it true that the princess will lead the diplomatic envoy to the principality? He then asked. Gray, who had regained his composure, nodded. Yes, and apparently... They'll be leaving at this hour, he explained. Adam has granted her request. She will be selecting some of the Rose Knights to join her as escorts and companions. Oh, I see, Darius muttered, his mind briefly thinking about the madman, who is currently in charge of the kingdom. At that very moment, a couple of familiar faces had arrived at the scene along with a small group of Imperial soldiers riding their horses. The sparring sessions halted as the rest of the young knights directed their attention to a certain redhead and a young noble page. Milady, some of the knights chose to bow before her highness while some, who personally knew the princess, decided to greet her as any close friend would do. Pina, Hamilton, the two men both watched the scene unfolding as the founder and head of the Rose Knights had finally arrived being received normally and warmly by his friends and companions. A small smile crept upon Gray's lips as he was glad to see the girl being treated like an ordinary girl. He was fully aware of how difficult the life of royalty was, 
and her student having the title as princess would usually put her into strange circumstances of sometimes being treated as if she was a god. Thank goodness, you had your mother's sense in you. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
There was still an unexplainable fear in the princess that kept preventing her from entering the quiet sacred grounds recently. Her father had already forgotten her memory, so as well as her own brothers. Diabo couldn't care since the wonders of materialism had become his own family and as for Zorzel. At that moment, the redhead noticed a figure standing in front of her mother's grave. Pina's eyes slowly widened in recognition as she continued to observe. However, an acquaintance had arrived on the scene at the same time. Milady, is there something the matter? Pina was quickly brought back to reality, and saw the imperial captain approaching her with a concerned look. She cleared her throat and regained her senses. Sir Darius, I thank you for your concern, but I am fine, she replied with a smile returning to the cemetery to find the mysterious man in commoner's clothing had vanished. Was it really him, or was it just all a figment of her imagination? The imperial captain nodded before changing the subject. Your Highness, I believe the envoy is already waiting at the gates. The man then informed. You're the only one that is missing. The young lady shook her head and smiled. Thank you for telling me. I'll be right there soon. She replied as another thought came into her mind. Maybe next time. The sun was nearing its peak that day as the preparations had finally been finished. The envoy was ready to depart as the imperial soldiers and the selected members of the Rose Knights had readied their own horses. Only a few handfuls of families and friends were present in the area to bid their own farewells. The princess and her brown-haired companion were also escorted to the lone carriage where they would spend the rest of the journey. Pina chose to wear the usual rose knight's armor while packing the more formal diplomatic attires into a couple of suitcases and chests. Darius quietly watched the small ceremony of departure from a corner, hoping that somehow the mission would be successful for them. He sighed as his mind returned to the plan. He won't be going to Alnus Hill this month to bring someone back to her supposed home as he was assigned to another mission. How should I tell her? He then looked towards the upper parts of the royal palace, as he thought about a certain young woman. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
quickly figuring out that there were bad intentions behind the scenes. She was able to catch a glimpse of his yellow intimidating eyes looking through her soul and she quickly pulled out, ignoring his presence, and continued to walk a bit faster. The tension in the air began to rise. Besides the sounds of her footsteps, she could finally hear the man's footsteps echoing throughout the halls as he was now following her from behind. Noriko could feel her panic and fear settling in, though she tried not to look too obvious and maintain her own professionalism. Moments later those footsteps began to grow louder and the old noble was eventually catching up to her, his expression having this sadistic and hungry Glasgow smile. Some of the nobles here had a reputation of claiming women and having them as their own sex slaves, so be careful. Most of our previous maids, unfortunately, didn't make it through the first few days. The words and advice kept repeating in her mind, though she was no longer a stranger to it. I am free now. I don't belong to them anymore, she exclaimed inside, as tears were now falling from her eyes. She eventually held the vase tight and attempted to run away as fast as she can. It didn't matter if water was spilled on the ground, as long as she could get into safety. She did manage to reach the final corridor, and knowing that the other maids were behind that door, she could just scream her lungs out for help. Yet unfortunately, a hand suddenly grabbed her from behind, and much to her disappointment, she met the lustful face of the old man. Noriko widened her eyes in terror, eventually dropping the vase on the floor, spilling water on the ground. You think you could get away from us, Matella? The old man then finally spoke with a hint of dissatisfaction and discontent in his voice. He gripped the oriental shoulder as tight as he can, preventing her chances of escaping. Noriko wasn't able to react quickly as the old noble slammed her into a nearby wall. You think being taken away by a lowly captain and worked as a maid would save you? He sarcastically asked and teased as he pinned her to the wall. In the midst of her agony, the young woman's heart began to beat faster. As the old man slowly drew out a knife, she found herself helpless. You try to scream, then I will cut your throat. He warned the girl, followed by beginning to touch and feel her body, moving her hands up towards her breast. I would rather prefer it, so I can taste the rest of your flesh. His voice slowly changed. Noriko, on the other hand, began to move and resist the old man, doing whatever she could to fight back. Additionally, she had noticed a strange dark force emitting from the man himself, which gave him this ridiculous strength to keep her in that position. To her surprise, the old man began to move the knife to her maid uniform in the hopes of severing the cloth and exposing her skin. This might be my lucky day, the old man said in delight, finally gaining a lifetime chance to have this young lady alone for himself. The others must be irritably jealous right now. Although, he suddenly felt a sharp pain that went through his crotch. Damn it, he exclaimed, letting go of the girl momentarily. Noriko had discovered a way to fight back, finding some kind of open weakness from below. She didn't think twice about hitting the old man's manhood with her knee, which temporarily paralyzed him. She took advantage of the opportunity to dash forward, but then she heard what appeared to be a subtle inhuman growl from the man and felt another force pull her to the wall. Little bitch, you won't give up to you? The old man gritted his teeth and decided to finally use his knife to silence the Oriental once and for all. Noriko, who was still perplexed that the nobleman had caught her so quickly, widened her eyes as her world began to slow down. This was her reality, and she was getting closer to death. At that moment, memories from her life began to flash before her eyes, and she felt a sense of peace wash over her. She didn't care any longer and just wanted it to be over because she wasn't going to live much longer. She would be delighted to be reunited with her loved ones in the afterlife, assuming that they were all killed during that day. By the time the knife was close to her skin, she caught a glimpse of a figure out of the corner of her eye, and the knife came to a halt as a hand emerged from the right, effortlessly grabbing the old man's hand. 
What? The noble exclaimed immediately turning to his right and seeing a familiar face. Her long silver hair and bright red eyes are what caught her attention. Noriko's lips instinctively moved as to mutter her name, Taiyosan. As for the old noble, his anger skyrocketed as he brought the knife towards the young woman, but miserably failed when he found himself getting disarmed in just a few seconds. As a result, the knife fell into her hands instead, and the warrior bunny woman was the one who pinned the now shocked and terrified old man against the wall, with the knife close to his neck. The nobleman shivered as he looked into the young woman's eerie calm eyes, knowing he had been caught committing an act that had nearly killed the oriental servant. At this point, he knew an apology wouldn't save him. How dare you! he exclaimed before adding, Do you know who I am? He tried to intimidate remind her of his higher status, despite being at her mercy. Unbeknownst to him, the warrior bunny was doing everything she could to keep her vengeance from overpowering her actions. She knew she could just give Buro the ghost signal and he dragged the old man down into the depths and then everything would be over easily. How she hated these kinds of men to the ends of the world. Quietness briefly took over for a few moments before the woman finally spoke. A perverted old man that doesn't deserve anything in this world perhaps? The door at the end swung open at this point, revealing a small group of imperial guards and the maids with whom Noriko had been working all day. What happened here? One of the imperial guards asked. By this point, Taiyo had decided to let go of the disgraced nobleman in order for him to reclaim what was left of his dignity. But his own pride remained, and he laughed arrogantly. With that position, he gave you... Do you think you're free to harass anybody in this palace? The white-haired woman smirked back. Do you think being a worthless noble gives you the right to claim a defenseless person as your own? She fired. The last time I remember these people are the ones responsible for maintaining this palace of yours. The old man gritted his teeth in irritation, fixing the collar of his noble attire. You should know your place, he exclaimed. You don't know who you're dealing with. Threats after threats, which came out from his mouth, the old man had enough and finally walked out of the scene in defeat, having his own plans being foiled by her unexpected arrival. The tension in the air had dissipated by this point, and the knife used by the noble was eventually turned over to the imperial guard as evidence in the looming investigation into this incident. Noriko, still shaken by the encounter had kept her head down as she was approached by her fellow maids. Are you okay, Noriko? Did that bastard old man try to hurt you? Unable to speak right away, she chose to slowly nod as a response, finding herself once again on safer company and grounds. Her gaze then shifted to the person who had previously saved her life and eventually became her very first friend in this place the one who helped her get back on her feet. Behind the emotionless exterior, she noticed a small smile forming around her lips as if to warn her to be cautious the next time she ventured alone through the halls. It didn't take long for her to leave the scene, ostensibly to attend to her own errands. Even though she had known her for a long time, she remained mysterious, as the other maids put it. She was already told not to speak regarding her past. Yet, many say, she was a person of great importance that fell from grace. Some say, she was an angry and lost soul vent on exacting her own vengeance. And some say, she was just an ordinary woman, escaping from a forgotten past. Despite the hardened emotions she possessed, there was always a faint genuine smile that would appear from time to time leading her to believe that there was still a glimmer of hope within. Behind that bitterness and suffering is a young soul filled with sorrow yet with a pure heart. Chapter End And Happy New Year everyone! I didn't expect that another chapter would be out this early and I didn't expect that it would reach 9k words. I am still confused as to how I was able to finish this. But then again I am glad that I was able to complete a chapter for 2022. Alright, 
This quick chapter is basically a sneak peek of what is going on the Sadran side of things. I really don't want to add more information regarding it since all of the stuff would be for the majority of Arc 3. So I just add a bit more mystery since I am still working on expanding the ideas and stuff. A reader had suggested to focus more on the perspectives of Pina and appearances from a handful of characters from Rose Knights. There's also Adam, a character from the Summoning Japan series who was also a general in the Loria arc who bailed out after the Loria kingdom was defeated by Japan. In this story, Adam is this mysterious figure who appeared out of nowhere and miraculously saved a very weak and dying sad era from crumbling apart, which had been in a dire situation for many years. For the time being, he is known as the man who took over Molt's responsibilities after something happened to him. Due to his presence, the situation and life at the palace and as well as the senate had drastically changed. I really wanted for Diabo to have his appearance in this chapter, but I felt it would be better if it were somewhere else, and the same goes for Zorzel since the majority of him would appear in Arc 3 as well. But I'll try my best to have him appear in the next chapters ahead at least to see what he's up to. And then there's Tayul in her second appearance. If I remember correctly, in the original canon, her relationship with Nariko had not been explored. And I think the god of cookery F.I.C. did well on that. Moreover, I wanted to continue the mystery vibe in her for now and in this scene I envisioned her doing sometimes more badass. Regarding the roles, I want Nariko to be in a better situation than what the original canon did to her, but still, the threat in the form of these nobles is still there to catch up with her. With that said, thank you very much for spending time to read the chapter. I really appreciate it. I apologize for any grammar slash spelling mistakes since English is not my main language. Thank you so much and God bless. 16. Arc 2. Draconian Blues. Disclaimer. I don't own Gate or Nyankoku Shokan as it belongs to its rightful owners. Arc 2. A City. A Diplomacy A Dragon. Draconian Blues. She had always imagined that by the time she reached adolescence, she would already be deaf. That is the fact that she had already exceeded the expected age she predicted and is currently still enduring it no matter what healing ability she was blessed with long ago when she became an apostle. To her, it was not a perk but an annoying blessing. Aside from that, she had lost track of how many years she had spent devoting the majority of her time to this monotonous task. She thought it was cool when she first heard about it. She imagined herself receiving long overdue praises for her forgotten hard work as a lowly priestess or even performing miracles for many who wished to follow her God and the church she belonged to. However, that was not the case. In the midst of a sunset, a small conflict took place in the highlands of the region. Giselle's eyes widened as she realized the giant red dragon had noticed her presence while she was carefully sneaking up on her. Oh crap, she muttered as she gritted her teeth and braced herself for another wild chase. The powerful creature growled as it moved away from its previous position and launched herself towards the draconian apostle, who made a quick dash and managed to escape the dragon's humongous mouth, which was about to devour her. The flame dragon, still in a beastly and wild state, pursued the young woman and followed her new trails. Its raged eyes remained fixed on the newcomer, suspecting that it had something to do with the disappearance. Giselle flew as fast as she could in the hopes of directing the beast to a much safer location where destruction could be limited, while also sparing any small settlements in the mountains, and she knew exactly where the area was. Every time she carried out a new version of her plan, it came at a cost, which was simply vast swaths of forest being burned or crushed by the beast. Navigating the numerous hills and mountain ranges was also difficult because it prevented her from having a smooth journey. At this point, the flame dragon had begun to release and breathe massive waves of fire in an attempt to prevent the young lady from fleeing completely. Everything was going downhill again. Oh, when will this end? 
she annoyingly exclaimed to herself, wanting to finally get this situation over with. Fortunately, the journey was brief, and she could finally see what appeared to be a valley-like area from a distance. She smiled in relief as she spotted the massive uninhabited cave near the top of a certain mountain. At the same time, a huge shockwave from the dragon itself had quickly reached her as she gripped her scythe, ready to perform the spell, destroying her momentum. By that point, the beast had gained a significant advantage and was approaching her at point-blank range. However, the draconian woman anticipated it, launching herself downwards into a large sinkhole overgrown with trees and greenery, and the beast followed as expected. Once she found herself descending, she drew out a small gray stone encrypted with a magical symbol, attached to her belt, and began to wait for the specific right time. Giselle finally made her move as the dragon growled and gathered more power to unleash another rain of fire. She first uttered a small incantation to activate a specific power within it and threw the small stone ahead of her, followed by raising her scythe and slashing the air, creating a shockwave that directly hit the stone itself. Gotcha! She exclaimed internally as a burst of energy manifested and erupted from the now destroyed rune. In the nick of time, the draconian apostle dashed away from the area, and the flame dragon herself had come face to face with the stone's power. As a result, a massive circle of ethereal light blue energy formed in midair and swallowed the large red reptile, transporting her to a different location. Mato and Toato, now! Giselle exclaimed once more drawing out two more stones from her belt and throwing them towards the nearby cave where a giant wall of stone was located. The two dragons heeded her summons and proceeded to breathe their own fires onto the stones, casting a variety of spells. Simultaneously, the previous circle of energy brought the flame dragon to the location and combined with the runes to form some kind of massive ethereal-like ropes and streams that pinned and bound the beast to the massive wall. The beast roared violently as if it were demanding to be let go. It struggled and attempted to resist the magic that was now binding her. Giselle, who had arrived just in time to see both of her companions guarding the beast, was nervous but curious. She patted both dragons on the back as if to compliment them on a job well done in carrying out the plan, and her gaze was drawn to the culprit. What happened to you? She inquired, concerned and perplexed as to how things had come to this. She had a feeling that there was a cause and she was confident that she had figured out a solution. This will break whatever spell or curse that plagued her. She recalled the old mage's words as she brought out another stone handed to her by the old woman. This time from a little pouch where she keeps the most valuable stuff she finds on her previous journeys. I hope this works she said as she took off from the ground and approached the beast. It was definitely her but the way the dragon acted as if it were a different being altogether. Don't worry, you'll be back to normal, she said as she uttered the incantation thus activating the rune's magical properties. The ethereal essence began to materialize once more as it encircled the entire facade of the beast in an attempt to liberate it from any purported curse that had been torturing her and thus the dragon began to settle down. Giselle thought the problem, which had lasted more than a decade, was finally coming to an end, and she thanked the old woman several times in her head, but she had no idea what was about to happen next. Almost there. Just as the dragon was now in a state of being removed from the supposed dark magic, it suddenly widened her eyes as the memories began to flash before its eyes. And the more it began to flood her mind, it began to build up its rage, and soon, it regained its strength. Breaking the essence that bound her released a huge portion of fire once more. Giselle was immediately thrown away because of the shockwave, though she was immediately caught by Mauto. However, the setback did not end there, as the flame dragon, now free of its temporary confinement, turned its attention to the trio and charged at them. Furthermore, as massive rocks began to fall, the cave's foundations began to crumble. Giselle, 
disappointed and shocked, attempted to flee the dragon's wrath once more. I am possible, how did she? She trailed off, finding herself on her way to the cliff's edge to take off. Despite this, the beast had gained an advantage as it approached the woman in less than a second. Meanwhile, the two smaller dragons came to a halt and faced the enemy, buying time for their master to flee. However, as they were about to engage in another close quarters battle, the red dragon suddenly widened its eyes and held its head and ears as if it was about to unleash fire. Giselle and the two smaller dragons froze in their tracks, overcome by confusion. While she desperately wanted to leave the premises, a part of her wanted to investigate further. At the same time, her ears began to pick up on what appeared to be a high-pitched screeching noise that began to build up louder, enough to incapacitate any living creature. Because the noise was too much for the draconian apostle, she cringed and covered her ears. The same was true for her dragon companions, who regarded the noise as torture. Her focus had shifted to the sky by this point and she widened her eyes in surprise as she saw what appeared to be glowing metallic beings in the shape of a long triangle with sharp edges and wings that zoomed past them at incredible speed, as if it came directly from the realm of the gods. The agonizing high-pitched noise faded, and in came a much more distinct sound that sounded eerily similar to the menacing phoenix of the higher planes. She then had a thought and she wondered if this small divine intervention was real. Giselle briefly gaped in awe at the sight before she was brought back to reality. She turned around and saw the flame dragon returning back to its senses. Shit! She swore for the first time, and knowing she didn't have much time to flee, she drew out another stone and forged it in the center of her weapon. She raised her scythe and began to draw a circle in front of her seemingly creating an energy shield that surrounded her and the two dragons. Though she was in the midst of casting the spell, the flame dragon abruptly came to a halt, and instead of launching another attack, it roared in pain and launched itself down into the massive wide sinkhole. At the same time, a section of the cliff began to crumble fast, startling the young woman, and she soon found herself falling alongside the massive rocks. X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X Hey, wake up, will ya? The next thing she felt was a wave of cold water that washed through her face. Giselle jerked up from the spare table where she had been resting and found herself in a very familiar narrow back alley. Her mind was still trying to figure out what had just happened. She went from seeing tall trees and mountains in her dreams to finally seeing the usual wooden structures of shops homes, and in standing tall. The highlight of it all was a pair of serious-looking eyes on the part of a teenage boy. It didn't take long for her to recognize him, and by then, she had regained control of her senses and emotions. What the heck was that, Albrecht? This was by far her first outburst of the morning, and seeing the boy's subtle snicker energized her even more. At least tried to wake me up properly. She grumbled pointing to the empty cup where the water had been, and not by rudely pouring water on me. The teenager slightly chuckled in return. Giselle, this isn't the first time you've been woken up like this, he reasoned. It's always been difficult to wake you up, he added, with a small smile. The young adventurer was already used to this type of scenario because whenever the girl found herself in another small existential phase, she would frequently take a sudden break to head to the back alley and do whatever she could to recover. However, it was common for her to eventually fall asleep in the end, for whatever reason, thus creating worrying thoughts for the others. The draconian lady rolled her eyes in return and dusted off her uniform, choosing to stay quiet instead of replying back. Is this really worth arguing for? Look, both of us are really drained of encountering the flame dragon, and as well as saving countless lives from her wrath. Albrecht explained. But we also gotta focus on this. He added, pointing towards the entrance, and subtly referring to a certain job. If we don't, we won't be eating filling our stomachs with delicious food all the time. Giselle wanted to laugh, 
knowing that the boy was the owner's actual nephew and had no chances of dying from hunger, but she grimaced at his statement. Even though she had been granted immortality, and no longer needed to feed herself to live, her desires and urges remained. Her love for food was still stronger, and it was torture for her not to have a single meal in a day. Albrecht was aware that this was one of his friend's primary motivations, and she even told him that she preferred to live her life in this manner. But there was one strange thing that drew his attention. He placed his hands on his hips and said, You've been in a daze again lately. He commented, Is there something bothering you again? He finally asked, wanting to get straight to the point of this new mystery. He thought the previous encounter of attempting to incapacitate the dragon for days went smoothly although there was something more to it. Giselle couldn't really handle the pressure from the boy's eyes. Of all the companions she had met up to this point, he was the best one at taking out the truth of someone. She eventually sighed and looked up to him. I'll tell you the whole story back inside. She yawned and then stood up, heading back to the back alley entrance in her usual casual manner. Yet there were hints of her trying to avoid those topics. Come on, I gotta earn more to pay the rent. The boy stared at her with a puzzled look, then he immediately remembered. Oh yes, my uncle told me that you haven't paid the rent in weeks by the way, he said, which exactly did not help in a way. Giselle shrugged it off and said, Tell the old man, he'll get his rent when he fixes that damn door. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
hours passed and the number of customers began to dwindle, and the second wave began in the form of unique individuals returning from their journey. The only thing that was left to do was to handle the guild section. Every now and then, there would be annual announcements regarding the updated and newly published quests. It was basically a big stack of papers, with various illustrations and details of quests and missions, to which she had to pin every single one of them on the big bulletin board at the main guild hall. Seriously, why do they have to establish a guild here? She thought to herself, having no choice but to use her wings to pin some papers on the higher spots, which could result in weird situations. Hey, if I see you perverts looking up, better pray and run or else. She narrowed her eyes and remarked, making a small subtle threat. Damn, she knows, run. What the? She got eyes on her but now, surprisingly, her suspicions turned out to be correct as a couple of sneaky adventurers made a run for it. She sighed once again. Flying while wearing a barmaid's dress was not the best combination. So she had to finish things quickly as possible before some fellow would stumble upon the scene and get himself in an aroused and inappropriate feeling. Fortunately, the task ended smoothly for her without any more interference. And before she could finish her task, the young lady's eyes halted towards a certain quest. Seriously? Who would take up this quest? She commented, brushing the illustration of a grand crystal off and pinned the last quest on the board. This is just a myth. After dismissing it, she was now on to her next task. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
Yes, that's the unbelievable part. I got reincarnated as a teenager again. A brief moment of awkward silence followed. This guy could be lying, Giselle thought, shaking her head. Wait, so how old were you in your world? The now surprised male elf asked again, while his companion casually shrugged. I think I was in my early thirties during that time, single and stuck on a dead-end job. Giselle found it hard to believe such tales. There was no such thing as one dying and then being reincarnated into another world in a different form. To her eyes, it was just a warrior's way of making his her background interesting in order to be accepted into a guild or a party. And nowadays with the darker force on the rise, there were a lot of individuals like him to start popping up. That is until the conversation reached into a more sensitive topic. You know, I really don't understand the idea of these apostles the young adventurer then said. What do they exactly do in this place? I mean, you've seen the likes of them before, right? He added. The male elf simply nodded. Yes, they are fierce as the bravest warriors to ever set foot in this land. And to many, they are considered as deities. He explained. But since the dawn of the guilds, they're almost left forgotten. Giselle slightly cringed at the statement. It was all true. He who needs them? I mean if they are powerful as many say they are, then why couldn't they stop the wild dragon attacks on poor villages? The young adventurer remarked, triggering some negative thoughts. Remember that dungeon full of the undead? He then said. If I remember correctly, the parties and their guilds were the ones responsible for cleaning that place. The young man wasn't going to stop yet. They couldn't even save those poor villages from the cursed goat men and orcs. Giselle could feel the essence of her irritation rising from within as the young man began to bring up every fault he knew regarding the apostles. Hush now, without their help in the first place, the lands and beyond would have been corrupted already. The male elf tried to reason out, but his friend continued bringing out the last fault. And the flame dragon wrecking havoc and destroying kingdoms, I bet the apostle in charge of that has already been expelled from whatever congregation she belonged to, he remarked. Next time, those churches would be employing the likes of us, he slightly boasted, since we're now doing the job better than they did before. So you're saying that they are not relevant anymore? Giselle's patience had finally run out. She walked away from the scene slightly slamming the mug she was cleaning with a cloth on the table. Her actions drew a lot of attention, particularly from the young adventurer and his male companion. Feeling dumbfounded about what had just happened, one of them could only ask the obvious question. What was that about? xxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxx
from parties made up of the most common warriors and common people who have now achieved something in their lives and are now hailed as heroes in their town, and some have even found glory in vast kingdoms. Then there's Giselle. He was taken aback by the name because he had not expected an apostle to have such a name in the first place. He had always imagined the names being more bombastic, special, and holy. Furthermore, he had no idea that this simple, brash, and sassy young lady would turn out to be the fearsome apostle of Hardy, a legendary figure. To his uncle, she was an old friend and companion throughout the years, though for the boy, she was more like his childhood neighbor back in his hometown, but older or basically an elder sister he never had. A simple person wanting to prove something in life. As more people began to approach him at the reception desk, a part of him silently came alive, encouraging him to look up, and there she was, walking towards the main entrance in the same bothered mood from before. Oh don't tell me she's been eavesdropping on those guys again, he sighed to himself. Curiosity quickly took over him, but his concern was more dominant. He felt an urge to follow her again yet. He also wanted to complete his current tasks and fortunately, the opportunity arrived in the form of a co-worker. Sorry Sir Albrecht, I am late. It was a certain wolf girl who had arrived at the scene. She had a freshly tired face and looked a bit messy, catching up to her breath, as if she had hurried her way towards her workplace without a conscience and care. Oh, hollow. I thought you'd be out for today, he then said with both of his eyebrows raised. I overslept, sir, and I also thought today was my day off, she said nervously with a smile, trying to explain her situation. Albrecht sighed in return and that is when the idea came to him. Um, hey listen, since you are here now, why don't you take over my position for a while and entertain our customers? He replied with a smile presenting the line of customers, which had surprisingly grown in just a span of several minutes. The wolf girl was taken aback by the sight and immediately felt overwhelmed to see the various grumpy faces of the customers, who were now barraging the girl with their requests and demands. Hey, I've been waiting for my seat. What's the hold up? I should be in my room an hour ago. As she was about to speak, the teenager patted her on the shoulder and quickly exited, leaving her stunned and dumbfounded, with no choice but to exclaim as loudly as she could in the midst of a now noisy reception area. I, uh... Sir Albrecht, where the heck are you going? XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
encounters if the problem is not resolved as soon as possible. You're really an idiot, Giselle. She muttered to herself, blaming her past decisions. And just as she was about to mock herself, even more, she was interrupted by a familiar voice. I had a feeling you'd be here. Giselle looked up and frowned seeing the teenage boy in front of him. Come on, Giselle, I know you're better than that. Just me leave alone, Albrecht. She told him with an annoyed tone of voice, before staring back at the blank space. Let me handle my own problems. She went on to say, wanted the boy to not get involved this time. The teenager could only form a sympathetic smile, but kept going as he approached the young lady, slowly figuring out the issue that has been bothering her. Hey, don't bother what they say or think about you, he said, trying his best to cheer her up. We all know they have big egos sometimes, he added and smirked. And besides, they got nothing that you've accomplished. Even though she hadn't responded to his remarks, he recognized the spark of confidence within her and wanted to help her overcome the difficulties she was experiencing. It's not about them or my reputation as an apostle in general, Giselle finally said. Many lives are at stake here. If I don't figure out what's been driving that dragon insane or find those flying iron horses that have somehow weakened her, I'm done for. They've been keeping that secret for a long time, she said, shaking her head. And now they're wondering why my predecessors couldn't even fix the damn problem and had been relying on me ever since. Albrecht sighed. It's not too late, you know, he replied. You have all the clues and hints at your disposal to help you, he added, prompting the latter to look at him with a puzzled but curious expression. And besides, I am here to help as well, he smiled. You are not alone. The wind grew stronger thereafter, and the mood began to change. Albrecht was determined to help the young lady figure out a couple of mysteries. You said that the flame dragon was under some kind of spell? He asked. And you also mentioned before that when the rune was destroyed, and you saw these vague memories just flashed before your eyes? Giselle returned the nod. Yes, she clarified. But I didn't believe it right away until I returned to the temple, she explained, still wondering if her predecessor's failure to fully inform her of all the issues surrounding the big red giant was intentional. I demanded answers, and thankfully, they told me everything, including the truth about the dragon's agony, she said. The truth? Albrecht wondered, and as he was about to continue his sentence, his small mancom crystal necklace began to glow and the familiar voice of Hollow spoke in amongst the din of the establishment, and demanding voices from the customers. Ah, uh, Master Albrecht, I believe someone here requires both Giselle and your presence. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
Albrecht raised both eyebrows because he had seen the man visit the inn a few times before conversing with his uncle, and he hadn't had the opportunity to get to know him better. However, now that he had the opportunity to speak with him face to face again, he wondered if this was the man his uncle had repeatedly praised. Never thought you'd be here in this time of the day, Bacchus, Giselle commented in a casual manner, with her hands on her hips. And I thought you were supposed to be giving bounties and quests at the other towns? She raised an eyebrow of puzzlement. The old man smirked in return, drawing out what appeared to be a piece of the folded poster from his pocket. I was, and I decided to return here in order to provide you information that I think would finally help solve your problem, Giselle. He explained, eyeing the draconian lady. By then, he led the two inside his carriage, which to anyone's surprise is big as anyone's living room. On both sides are couches that can also serve as beds and a green sofa opposite from the other entrance. Giselle and Albrecht took both of their respective seats as the old man continued his speech. But first off, I would like to commend you both for saving that tiny village in the mountains several days ago, he remarked before adding. And Albrecht, I hope your uncle is aware of your little dangerous sidelines. This time, he eyed the boy, who tried to look away in purpose but kept a surprised face, wondering how the man knew of him secretly taking up quests. Bacchus cleared his throat, placing his small jug on the table. As he unfolded the poster, the man finally revealed and presented its contents. The two then leaned closer and came face to face with the revelation. A circus in Quatoin? A puzzled Giselle wondered. I don't get it why. Look closely. The old man said as he pointed towards the small but important text which read, The Debut of the Red Dragon. The young lady's eyes widened in surprise, and her curiosity peaked. The teenage boy, on the other hand, was more skeptical and was able to summarize the idea in a matter of seconds. Are you saying this is the one that the flame dragon is looking for? He inquired. And it's trapped in a ship? Exactly. Bacchus simply nodded. Apparently, one of my colleagues had connections in the circus business, and he was able to gain access and study the creature's appearance and traits before the ship had set sail, he informed the two. And based on the information provided by your church and the current information at hand, the description is a match. And the dragon is without a doubt the offspring of the flame dragon, he concluded. And the beast will be one of the main attractions of the said circus when it opens to the public during the Principality's Day of Unity celebrations, he added. Both of them nodded in understanding. So if this is really her offspring, then how the heck did it get there? Albrecht then wondered. Bacchus then had the draconian apostle this time. Giselle sighed in response, beginning to relay the previously classified information that her colleagues at the church had finally revealed to her. Before I took over the case, the previous apostle, who was in charge of keeping the land of the dragons in check at the time, had somehow failed to monitor the matriarch's offspring and one night, the whelp vanished under mysterious circumstances. She went on to explain, because of that incident, the flame dragon abandoned her duties as guardian of her world and left home in search of her beloved whelp. That is until she started attacking every single settlement she came across for no apparent reason. She continued bringing up a small rune from her pouch. I suspected that dark magic has something to do with her rage and I tried to use the rune to free her but she escaped again. But what about those iron horses you saw that time? Asked the boy. Could they be summoned again? He wondered. I mean, they could really help us deal with the beast with their strange magic. As you saw, Giselle remained silent as she turned her gaze to the old man, who shrugged, confirming that he, too, had no idea about the mysterious metallic objects. So where we do we go from here, Sir Bacchus? She then asked. The old man smirked, taking note of the young lady's sense of respect, recognizing what he used to be, as he took another drink of his ale. Good, I've already informed my colleague about your impending arrival, 
and he'll be glad to provide you with shelter once you arrive in the principality, he told the two, who were taken aback. That quick? I mean, you're really going to give us a free ride there? Albrecht widened his eyes, becoming more optimistic and imagining the possibility. The old man cringed in return. It was not exactly a part of his plan to bring the two there, and it was only his job to give them helpful information. But since the dukedom itself has severed every main connection it has, then they have no choice but to take the secret merchant routes to get there. He then sighed. Fine, I'll take you both there by land, since flying there would create trouble on the principality's airspace. He said, much to the teenager's gratefulness. Yes. That's what I'm talking about, old man. The boy then formed his hands into a fist and slightly punched the air. Giselle, on the other hand, rolled her eyes and tiredly let herself collapse on her seat. She had hoped this would be the final clue in ending this ordeal. The old man cleared his throat. All right, I am asking you two again, he said, giving them a now serious look despite the visible drunkenness on his face. This venture will also be risky especially for you kid. He then eyed the boy, whose confidence was now skyrocketing. I suggest you let her handle this. Silence took over for a brief moment, and the young adventurer didn't hesitate to make a grin. Count me in, he replied, turning his attention back to his companion. I'm not afraid of any challenges, he added, indicating that this type of situation was no longer unfamiliar to him. Giselle took a deep breath knowing she wouldn't be able to stop the young adventurer from joining, and raised her hand, giving a simple thumbs up and a somewhat determined look. I'm in. A small smile then formed across the old man's lips, clapping his hands together, as he gave one more encouragement. Well then, what are you waiting for? Time to pack up. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
There is also a cameo referring to a generic reincarnated Ice Sky character, who eventually became a warrior in this world, and Albrecht is meant to be that young adventurer, who is eager to face any challenge. With that said, thank you very much for spending time to read the chapter. I really appreciate it. I apologize for any grammar slash spelling mistakes since English is not my main language. Thank you so much and best wishes. 15. Arc 2. Interlude. A Prelude to the Noble City. Disclaimer. I don't own Gate or Nihonka Shokan as it belongs to its rightful owners. Arc 2. Interlude. A Prelude to the Noble City. Can you hear the sounds of the bustling city? Aside from the countless voices of its people, man and demi-human alike, a familiar aura of peace and life enveloped the place that had been there since its inception. From above, a symbol and an imaginary heart that continued to beat and give life beyond. Their very presence had drawn a lot of souls who still sought hope and refuge, alliance and connection, for waning societies that are falling apart, and finally, for certain individuals with their own goals and ambitions. There were definitely rumblings within all of it. A day of celebrations has begun, and an unexpected visitor has arrived, bringing potential havoc. A group of good-hearted men with only diplomacy and assistance on their minds, a royal eager to save lives from her own empire's threat, apostles facing their own trials and a young mage seeking to unravel a forgotten truth buried within the principality itself. All these events will coincide as fate would foretell it, and as for a certain writer, the opportunity would openly welcome him, and whatever secret this place holds would eventually come to light for him to witness. Seeing the outline of the place's massive walls, he moved his hands to an empty page of his small book, and wrote the name of the new ark with his trusty pen, a prelude to the noble city. And this may be a preview and a prologue at the same time that I could write for now, since the actual chapter is still in the works and pretty much won't be out soon since real life matters are in the way again. Sighs. But other than that, thank you for giving time to read the chapter. 17. Arc 2. Noble City I. Disclaimer. I don't own Gate or Nyankoku Shokan as it belongs to its rightful owners. Arc 2, A City, A Diplomacy A Dragon, Noble City I Arrival. The symbols on the wall did match, and it was all according to certain pieces of parchments containing the riddles and the small illustration to which they had provided her. She stood there amid the darkness, and the moon that gave light on a certain large hallway leading to a bigger area. After months of searching, she finally found the place. A place deemed sacred and holy, and where it was hidden for thousands of years. She knew it wasn't the right time to break in and take it. Although, she kept that optimism and confidence high knowing that she would be claiming a part of a long-awaited victory for her homeland. A smile crept across her lips as she gripped the papers in her hand. Just a few more days. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
which, unlike the other nations, was not a true military or army. Sure, several divisions were dispatched to places where conflicts and tensions were at an all-time high, but only for humanitarian purposes. Even he has yet to see what real conflict is, and now he was getting the opportunity to be a part of it, in the form of this gate to another world fiasco. Everything all right, General? His American counterpart asked, interrupting his thoughts. The Japanese general nodded slightly. Yes, sir, though, if I may ask, how many more camps do we have to see destroyed? He asked. General Wilkes chuckled back. I believe this is the final footage. For now, he explained, surprised by the large number of camps scattered across the continent. And Ms. Miles here has something more interesting to present, he added, gazing at the blonde woman. The secretary woman simply nodded as she rose from her seat and moved closer to the screen. She took a deep breath and adjusted her glasses slightly before pressing a button on a small device, which changed the images projected on the screen. Well, it's not that special, but just a couple of things. I'll elaborate, she explained, her gaze fixed on the screen, which depicted the entire camp before it was destroyed. It turns out that the person who provided the location of the camp is an imperial soldier himself, a deserter from the said camp, to be exact. She explained, pausing to allow the men to process the information. I see, so is it the same story of a soldier deserting his post and rebelling against his homeland? General Wilkes inquired, recalling the statement of various imperial soldiers performing the same actions. The secretary women slightly smiled in return. Interesting story. The guy did it to exact his revenge on the entire division, as he claimed they were being tyrants and performing inhuman acts on the base for months, she explained. Some of the officials were taken aback by her statement. Now, that's something new, General Wilkes remarked though, aside from their egos growing. Being stationed in a secluded area near the mountains can drive you insane. The secretary woman simply nodded. Not just any ordinary secluded area, she clarified. According to the information provided by the soldier, the location of the imperial garrison is actually part of the dragon territories. Dragons? Do you mean the entire land is inhabited by these creatures? General Hanzama asked receiving a quick nod from the young lady. Yes, the entire mountain range is technically their own home, she continued. And when we asked Mr. Cato more about the location, he remarked how the team made a wise decision not to venture further. General Wilkes cocked his brow. Why is that so? Simply because the dragons living in that land are not the usual ones that we are used to seeing, she explained, adding, they have their own organized communities, and they are very protective of their territories. Interesting, General Hanzama observed. However, did the team happen to cross paths with one of them during the airstrike? He inquired. The secretary woman adjusted her glasses again. Which brings us to the next report, she said, pressing the button again as the image on the screen changed once more. One of the drones happened to capture this image of a massive red dragon several miles from the main target, she continued, and it was taken just after the airstrike began. The remaining coalition officials examined and studied the captured image, which depicted the massive red dragon confronting an unknown individual on the edge of a cliff surrounded by mountain ranges and a massive sinkhole filled with greeneries and forests. The images gradually changed, revealing the dragon being beaten by the mystery person with similar but smaller wings attached to its back. The last image finally displays the red dragon collapsing as it fell towards the sinkhole. For a few moments, silence reigned supreme as the rest of the group tried to comprehend what had happened in that brief scene. In response, the American general sighed. It's no surprise that there are people who can deal with these creatures with incredible strength, he remarked. The question I have in mind, if this is something to be concerned about, he added. Well, it could be an adventurer, a dragon slayer, or an apostle like Ms. Mercury, 
General Hansima speculated, taking note of the alleged young lady's earlier statement. Oh yes, that one. General, Wilkes sighed again, still in disbelief that certain characters deemed fictional in their world, do exist in this new world. Since the coalition discovered the existence of apostles and other individuals capable of the supernatural through the apostle of Emra herself, the thought and information itself had continued to bother them for the rest of the months. The only good news is that they could take so far is that these types of people are a rarity in the land. So far, there have been no incidents or reports of recon teams encountering hostile individuals with the same capabilities. The last information the Apostle of Emmer had provided was that there were only a few remaining Apostles in the land. It was by chance that she was on their side, and as for the dragons, they could only hope that they would not leave their land to wreak havoc across the lands. In the midst of the conversation, the Japanese general decided to change the topic, directing the attention to a recent ongoing operation. So what's the status of the diplomatic team? XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
The gate is just a part of the complexity of this world, he then said. It's not just a portal that connects between worlds, but a blessing and a curse as well, he explained. Every once in a while, conflicts would arise resulting in death, destruction, and when desperation comes thus people prayed for salvation, a gate would appear as a last resort. It's the last and only blessing that the waning gods gave to the people of this world. Yuji took his time digesting the information, but he eventually grasped it. So, when that gate reappeared, it chose my world to be the saving grace? He inquired, raising an eyebrow. But why? The duke grinned. We could say that, he explained. There are a lot of reasons, though I always believe that the gate's power and intentions are often for the greater good of everyone. This world has suffered enough, and it's time for fate to step in and change the course. Once again, silence reigned supreme. Yuji kept a puzzled expression on his face as he tried to figure out why the gate was there. It appeared plausible enough that it had been created by God's sacrifice and love for the inhabitants of this world. However, when he spoke with the locals back at the refugee camp, they seemed to believe it at first but then lost faith, and some simply forgot the story. Unfortunately, he had one more question which he had been pondering since first meeting the man. How did you know my name in the first place? He muttered loudly enough for the merchant. The chubby silver-haired man remained silent but smiled. Should he tell him now or wait for the right time for the young man to figure it all out? He thanked a specific person for providing him with important information about him, and he promised not to forget that promise. As he was about to speak, the horse pulling the wagon quickly halted its tracks and made a noise. The sudden scene startled the young rider, and his first instinct was to look at the open window. But by the time he did, he noticed the massive walls that stretch all over and beyond. As for the merchant, he cleared his throat and finally announced the news. Looks like we've finally arrived at our destination. He relayed the news before adding, Welcome to Kwa Toyn. X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X. The envoy finally arrived at their destination around high noon, but they did not expect to find themselves in the current situation in front of them. The Alevis followed what their guide had done, and they all halted at a specific area. Most of the members from Third Recon had been woken up from their daydreams by the sudden stop, and each of them began to wonder. They could feel that something was definitely going on. Karada blinked a few times as he tried to investigate from his window, but all he could see were glimpses of the vast green fields and beyond, and it wasn't until a few moments later that a small wagon appeared in front of him. I thought we were all in a single file, he wondered, unable to recall another wagon traveling alongside the LAV he was currently riding in. I could say the same. Itami remarked this time, who was also looking at his own window, this time seeing more wagons and carriages as they began to pile up. Karada raised an eyebrow in confusion. He looked back again to his window, and this time saw what appeared to be village children gazing upon him with curiousness. That could only mean. He trailed off his words as he was now figuring it out. At the same time, the radio came to life and a familiar voice emerged. This is Lieutenant Brian. We just arrived at our destination, though we're not the only ones here. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
he gathered himself to assist as many as he could. Open the gates. He could hear the voice of his superior giving the order, and along with his fellow guards, they proceeded to pull each certain lever, and thus the massive gates began to open. By the time the gates to the city had finally opened, the eyes of each migrant lit with relief and joy as they could finally have the opportunity of restarting their lives once more. Less than a second, they proceeded to venture inside but not without any official document they have to verify their reasons and claims. Please state your purpose of going here and show any proof. My relatives had informed me, through a letter, that they have a spare room for me to stay here. Our village was ransacked by dark raiders not long ago, and we are the only ones left of our community. Business has been on low on the east, so I am planning to move and re-establish my shop here. We are representatives from a small kingdom state from the south, and our purpose here is to establish connections with the principality. These were just some of the reasons they were heading here, and as they passed through the gates, they didn't forget to thank the guards. And these people would not have arrived if it hadn't been for the secret passages. As time passed, the numbers dwindled until they came face to face with the last visitors, who arrived in an unusual convoy. The appearance of these green iron horseless carriages alerted them, but also confused them, as they noticed that they were being led by a merchant wagon. The guard kept steady but didn't take long enough for him to recognize the man in charge. The chubby merchant made his presence known as soon as the wagon came to a halt, beginning with a smile. Greetings. It's been a while since we've last met. He greeted the rest of the guards. The guard in charge stared wide-eyed at a familiar face. As Sir Duke, you're back, he remarked. The merchant simply smiled. Of course. I thought it would be a great idea for me to return here for a while after a long journey. He explained before adding, Besides, I brought representatives from a certain nation that you probably won't believe right away. The man directed his finger at the four green metallic forts and the humans who rode them. The younger guard raised both eyebrows in surprise, Oh, I see. So you brought another diplomatic envoy with you. He finally asked the question that had been bothering him for a while. The merchant smiled again. Oh yes, the usual. I may suggest that you contact your superiors, as this is rather important, he added. Sensing the man's seriousness, the young guard nodded and turned to face his comrades, signaling that the last visitors were fine. As a result, they yanked on the levers, and the gates reopened. Thank you very much, the duke exclaimed as he pulled out an expensive wooden box. There are sweets inside for all of you hard-working men to share, he explained as he encouraged the horse to keep going. The young guard was speechless, knowing that the box containing the sweets came from a northern nation across the Great Orient. Before he could say anything, the wagon had passed him and he was faced with the moving metallic forts. As he observed each of these magnificent yet intimidating moving objects, he caught glimpses of the people with strange helmets inside. Humans? He muttered to himself. Most of them are. It was strange yet surprising, and they claimed to be from a kingdom on the continent. Despite this, he had never seen a kingdom in his life that could produce this type of transportation, unless a nation from the first civilizations had established a kingdom here. Nonetheless, his attention focused more on a certain young lady who was observing everything. Oracle of Emra? He asked himself again. How could a legendary figure from stories he'd heard as a child be a part of this anvo? XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
She was much a younger girl during those times, and as a result, it broadened her perspectives towards life. Looking through the window as the vehicles passed the gates, she was now seeing the first signs of life and a small smile crept across her lips, knowing that the place hadn't changed a bit since her last visit. Whenever she had the opportunity to return here, there would always be a reason. The previous one was just as important as the current one, and she knew it would be a little more dangerous this time around. She looked towards the streets again and saw certain signs displayed on every shop, wall, and home, bearing the words, Day of Unity. She gave a certain smile, recalling her predecessor's words. Quatorn is one of the last bastions of hope during the conflict against dark forces, and this is where the turning point for this land's victory began. Until now, that certain event had been an important factor in the history of the continent and she would get the chance again to witness it. Yet, she still had her own duties to fulfill first. The special convoy continued to drive along the wide cobbled streets, which were now surrounded by various architectures, ranging from beautiful colonial-style shophouses, temples with unique greenery designs that were obviously elvish-inspired, to structures with massive pillars that could be compared to the ancient cities of the Greek world but have its own identity. Furthermore, every street they had passed through was alive with activity. Humans and demi-humans flooded the same area, revealing the unique clothes and dresses they wore, in addition to the various stalls stationed along the sidewalks, which were sometimes partnered with majestic trees. Damn, even the sidewalks are pretty alive, the voice of a certain American ranger remarked and there's this distinct smell that I can't seem to figure out. Carl felt his own excitement growing within him. For the past minutes they entered the gates, he had been captivated by the ongoing vibrant scenery in front of him. He could only simplify his own words for now. I'm not sure, but this was the same experience I had when I played that Final Fantasy VR game from a friend of mine, he added as he continued to observe from his window. Brian could only sigh in response, but he agreed with the latter's observation. The place so far definitely had that high fantasy vibe from various video games and movies he'd seen before. But the only difference was that it wasn't the typical medieval-inspired setting, but something else entirely. It looked more ancient, yet grander and spiritual. You know Bree. I think I finally found a nice vacation spot for the family when all of this is finally over, he told the older man. I mean Disneyland and Paris are okay, but this is a thousand times better, and sure mom and dad would love hanging out in one of those coffee shops, he added, pointing to the various cafes they passed by. For a few moments, silence reigned as the older soldier nodded slightly. I know that. But we have to focus on the mission here first, he sighed. We still don't know what threat this place could pose. He wasn't entirely wrong in his assumptions. It was fine to be skeptical and cautious, and his previous experience with the Kota Village incident had only made him more protective. Come on, Brian, the intelligence division has confirmed that this place is not like that Southern Empire everyone is talking about, Carl said half-jokingly. I mean, even Ms. Rory has said there's nothing to worry about. Brian remained silent once more. Perhaps his childhood friend, to whom he treated as a young brother had a point, and perhaps he was just a little paranoid after watching those movies that could cause him trust issues. Carl looked at the younger soldier with a slightly worried expression, and before he could say anything else, he heard a couple of taps on his window. When he turned to his left, he was startled to see a small being staring back at him. What the heck? He exclaimed, catching the attention of the rest. Everything all right, Carl? His fellow ranger Al, who was mostly quiet the whole time, asked. Um, yeah, I am all right. The Californian soldier immediately calmed down and examined the little being or should he say, a glowing little human with wings. It was a female a beautiful little young woman floating in midair space, smiling and holding what appeared to be some kind of wooden sign that was many times larger than her. 
Let me guess, a fairy? Brian spoke while unfazed by the scene. Carl simply nodded as he tried to decipher the writings on the wooden sign. Damn, I wish I brought that dictionary. He muttered with regret in his voice, referring to that small notebook containing alphabets and phrases which were translated to their language. As the LAV continued to move, the small fairy went along with them, trying hard to get them enticed to whatever she was telling them. Say Brie, can you translate what the sign says? Carl then asked, referring to the wood. Brian sighed back. Sorry, I can't read their words but you can ask Al. I heard he was then cut. Sorry man, I still suck at reading otherworldly languages, Al said immediately, denying that he had been studying hard to learn more of the local writings. Well, since there's no language barrier between us and them, why not just open the damn window and ask her directly? Brian suggested, his face slightly deadpanned. Oh, why didn't I think of that? A dumbfounded Carl wondered and remarked, as proceeded to open the window. Yet, at the same time, a certain young lady interrupted him. The sign means buy six water runes and you get one free. Rory spoke for the first time, attracting the man's attention. Really? Carl raised an eyebrow. You mean this little lady right here is advertising something to me? He asked, pointing directly at the fairy who was still bent on convincing him to buy the items. And just to be clear, magical creatures in this world have jobs here as well? The apostle simply smiled back. Well, contrary to popular belief, fairies and other kinds can have their own livelihoods as well, she explained before teasingly adding, Don't tell me you were thinking and assuming all of them live primitively in forests. She smirked. Carl was a bit taken back by her statement. Well, I was just curious, but at least I'm glad to know that they have the right to work or get a job, the young man explained as he observed the fairy, who was now losing patience in trying to entice him. And in the following moment, another thought came up to him. How do runes work, by the way? He then asked. By then, Rory yawned in return as she drew out a small object from her pocket. The item which turned out to be a small square-shaped stone with a symbol engraved on it began to glow. The apostle smiled as the teacher side of her emerged, eager and proud to show the man the wonders of her world. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
as he began to wonder if he was hallucinating seeing full water bottles in some areas inside the vehicle. The older woman shifted her gaze towards the man and simply smiled. Oh, this, she said before turning to a certain blonde elf girl. Well, I guess I have to thank Tukasan for refilling my bottle. A slight guilty expression escaped from her. And I guess I am sorry for not telling you guys right away. She apologized while giving a nervous grin thereafter. But if you want your own bottles to be refilled, then she really has something unique to show you too. The rest quickly lit their eyes wide and shifted their attention towards the girl herself. Tuka's eyes widened in surprise before she cracked a grin of her own. Knowing that the spotlight was now on her, she had no choice but to introduce them to a minor mechanic of a certain magical artifact. The elf girl drew a small square-shaped stone with a large bluish glowing symbol engraved on it and showed it to the men in green, who were intrigued. Um, for those who are unfamiliar with this stone, it is essentially a water rune, she explained as the others stared at her like curious schoolchildren. That's pretty neat, Karada remarked. On other hand, Shino wanted to get to the main thing. So how does it work? She then asked, with a little hint of forcefulness in her voice. Well, Tuka grinned nervously, moving her eyes around in search of a second object. She had no idea the men in green were so eager to learn and know everything about the world. At the same time, the elf girl felt a tap on her shoulder from behind and turned to face her blue-haired friend who was handing her a large empty jug. Oh, thank you, Lele. She smiled as she took the empty jug and proceeded to perform a brief magic show. Tuka took the rune and placed the rock on the empty jug, closing her eyes and faintly uttering a word. Moments later, the symbol began to glow brighter and a small sound was heard from the jug. They all widened their eyes in awe as they saw actual water appear inside the transparent jug from thin air. Damn. Magic is something else, I tell ya. Higashi remarked, leaning in closer to investigate further and finally confirm the supernatural occurrence. Once the rune symbol faded, the elf girl smiled as she handed the man the now full jug of water. Here you go. She said you can all share the drink. Oh, this is so cool. Higashi enthusiastically accepted the jug, and in the back of his mind, he planned to take the first drink to finally quench his own thirst. However, at the same time, Shino, Karada, and even Itami, who was in the driver's seat, excitedly exclaimed in unison to prevent what he originally planned on doing. Please refill my empty water bottle. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
With another awkward silence filling the mood, Shino cleared her throat and continued the conversation. So to use this magic stone, you just have to say the secret words to activate whatever magic inside? She asked as her curiosity was still there. Lele simply nodded. Yes, although, it's only a part of the whole process. She informed them. A part of the whole process. Right. Karada simply nodded, appearing to understand everything. The blue-haired teen then took a short deep breath. Well, it's simply a combination of willpower, faith, and if you were born with natural mana energy, then you won't have any problem using them. Shino rolled her eyes in response. Well, that sucks. I don't have mana in my body or any spiritual faith, she remarked, a hint of disappointment in her voice. Tuka, on the other hand, cracked a smile. Well, if you asked me, it depends on how much you believe or trust it, the elf girl replied. Everyone in my home village had a strong belief in magic, so we could use it in our everyday lives. As the memories began to flow once more, the girl trailed off and stayed quiet. Eventually, it would lead her back to her main goal. Anyways, girls, I am really curious. What's going to be your goal here in this city? Karada was the one to ask this time. The young man staring at the mage and the elf, who were both suddenly enveloped by this sense of concern. They were obviously bothered by their own problems. At this moment, Tuka forced herself to gather enough courage to explain why she had volunteered in this mission. Well, I heard that my relatives and friends had moved here in the principality after my village was destroyed by a wild dragon, she explained. That's why I came along with you all, to see if they really made it here and are okay. Oh, Karada grumbled before looking at the blue-haired mage. How about you, Ms. Lele? Are you looking for your relatives as well? He inquired. The young girl took a deep breath and gripped a small book. No, I came along here to learn more about a certain artifact that the enemy is desperately looking for, she said more cryptically. Her thoughts were solely on the Principality's Great Library, one of the country's oldest libraries. The rest of the recon team just stared at her, perplexed and intrigued. An artifact? Shino asked, and as she was about to continue, she felt a strong tremor inside the vehicle. X X X X X X X X X X X X X. It was during that time that the LAVs had finally reached their destination. All of the green metallic moving machines had come to a halt in the middle of a wide open plaza filled with various groups of people. The merchant wagon, which was leading the way, also came to a halt in front of a row of makeshift tents near the gates of what appeared to be a massive majestic palace. Mr. Takamori. I believe it's time to board out of the wagon, the merchant said. They are expecting you and your people. As he heard the man's words, Yuji's heart began to beat loudly from within, and a slight nervousness began to show in his eyes. Nonetheless, the young man proceeded to open the wagon doors and step outside for the first time, and when he finally saw the light again, he was overcome by a coldness he hadn't felt in a long time. Despite the sun and clear blue sky, he did not expect a particularly cold climate in the city. I wish I brought my coat. He muttered with a little shiver before he started to observe his surroundings. There were a lot of people at this point, and they were forming a line that was being directed by numerous guards towards the palace's gates. These groups of people, dressed in distinctive garb and bearing a variety of identities, cultures, and races, turned out to be the representatives of the continent's independent small states. He could see a hint of desperation on their faces as they prepared to meet with the palace's top officials. Ah, look what we have here, the duke said, smiling. Never expected the numbers to increase to this. The man greeted the cold, anxious morning breeze as if it were nothing out of the ordinary. Hopefully, their own states are paying them enough for their duties. Yuji widened his eyes in astonishment. This many? he asked, only to receive a chuckle from the older man. Well, Kwatoin usually receives fewer diplomatic visits, but nowadays it's more like a crowded market, he explained, 
lighting up a small pipe for a brief smoke. Of course, what's the only place with nearly unlimited supplies of wheat, grain, and food? This is what happens when an empire is swallowed up by its own corrupted ambitions, and you have these poor and defenseless kingdoms clinging to the last hope they thought, he continued. The principality is really living up to its moniker of last bastion of hope. Since the time of the Ravernals, the wind grew stronger as quietness took over for a few moments until the two certain men had finally arrived. Mr. Duke, recognizing the familiar voice, Yuji turned to face Atami and Lieutenant Brian, who recently had just exited their vehicles. The merchant grinned as he issued a slight bow of greeting. Ah, lieutenants! How was the journey for you and your men? He asked. Itami scratched the back of his head with a grin. We're fine, sir. Just a little tired from sitting in our seats for hours, he chuckled. But we're ready to meet the ones in charge and have our main representatives continue with the negotiations. Do we still have to stand in line, sir? Brian inquired, looking around at the various groups of diplomatic envoys awaiting entry. Although... The duke simply raised his hand in an elegant manner. Oh, no need to worry about that. He assured them, before shifting his attention towards a couple of familiar faces. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
Her curiosity peaked when she learned that the old man had apparently remained in the capital, having heard of the recent switching and replacing of positions within the government body. I was going to, until one of the Ministry of Affairs heads was assassinated during an attempted siege by Sadran forces in a neighboring kingdom, he explained. And the next thing I know, I'm being summoned back to be his temporary replacement until they find someone qualified to do the work, he sighed, exhausted. I'm not sure when I'll be able to return to my original duties. Ione returned the sympathetic expression. She, too, was in a similar situation, having been assigned additional tasks of monitoring diplomatic visitors by her superiors in addition to her original task of managing areas at the defensive walls and towers. So far, she couldn't believe the increase in numbers and asked herself numerous times, why would they ask for assistance against an empire that the principality has no chance of defeating? What's in it for them? At that point, she felt small tremors on the ground and heard an unfamiliar sound that she couldn't place. When she turned to face the source of the sound, a small ruckus erupted as a crowd began to form and follow what appeared to be massive horseless carriages approaching them. General Hankey was frozen beside her, surprised, puzzled, and perplexed by what was happening in front of him. The roaring sounds of mythical lions and beasts are produced by horseless green iron objects. Should he alert the guards in case they had bad intentions? Although, the same guards were escorting them towards where he was standing. Does that mean they weren't really a threat? Then his attention drifted towards a certain familiar wagon that he had seen many times before, and moments later, he recognized the chubby merchant, who stepped out from his domain and greeted him. Oh, General Hankey, it's a pleasure to meet you again. Duke, he muttered aloud. What in the world is going on? He quickly asked. And who or what are these things along with you? He raised his concern. Oh, you're referring to this? The merchant raised both eyebrows before shaking his head. They are the latest group of diplomatic envoys that I brought, he simply explained. And you don't have to worry about them, he added. They are not demons or monsters. When he finished speaking, the doors of the metallic irons opened and what appeared to be humans in strange green attire stepped out almost all of them carrying strange black artifacts that looked like a mage's staff. Two men drew his attention, and he immediately assumed they were the envoy's leaders. General, I would like you to meet Lieutenant Yuji Atami and Lieutenant Brian Wilson, the merchant announced. They are from a newly established nation from the south and would like to request an immediate meeting with the humble prime minister. A brief moment of silence then took over as the two took the time to make sense of the new information. South? Which place in the south? Ione asked, raising an eyebrow of skepticism. Alnus region. My dear, the duke replied with a smile. General Hankey nodded in understanding. I see, though without due of respect, Alnus region is nothing but farms, fields, and wild mountains with several Sadran imperial camps and garrisons scattered around. He explained in a polite but serious manner. It was then when one of the men in green cleared his throat and spoke. That's what we've discovered when he entered through the gate. Itami informed the man. Gate? General Hanky said and wondered aloud, while Ione glanced at the man. The duke gave a chuckle. Oh yes! Of course, ever heard of the rumors regarding the return of the gate, and of all places it opened on a supposed sacred hill, he went on to say, and eliminated most of all the imperial garrisons stationed there? The two Quatoinian natives were left speechless by the man's statement. There were indeed reports or rumors of battles recently taking place at the said area surrounding the hill, and their constant pockets of massive fires lighting up during the night. As they began to put the pieces of the puzzle together, the American lieutenant cleared his throat this time and finally said, We're from another world, sir, believe or not. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
his desk, and a stack of documents and papers which were waiting for him to review and sign, like an ordinary day for the prime minister of an old and holy land. Indeed, it still struck him by surprise that the principality retains the blessing from the gods, despite the attempted invasions and conflicts throughout the years. He wasn't sure if it was the actions of previous leaders or the wise diplomatic decisions that kept the nation standing until now. With yet another threat from a rising and dangerous Sauron Empire, the situation led many people to believe that the Quatoin Principality has entered its last years. Yet still many of them hadn't lost hope and were looking forward to being part of the Day of Unity celebrations in the next incoming days. Kanada was old enough to witness many of the dangers that the Principality had faced. Being a child during those times, he saw how his home had become the bastion of hope many times. Neighboring kingdoms and nations across the seas were on board and pledged themselves to fight and defend the peace which was established after the fall of the demon lords that attempted to conquer the lands in the name of their empire. His grandfather and father were part of the governments that continued and maintained the peaceful relations between the kingdoms in the continent and outside the continent, mainly the nations in the third civilizations. The legacy that became a strong force was now falling apart, and on the verge of being erased once the enemy had found a way to enter the city. The young elf man sighed as he tried to brush off any negative thoughts. He stared at the papers before him, which were mostly proposals and letters from other surviving small kingdoms eager to join forces and establish a stronger relationship with the principality. He still wondered why some of these small kingdoms didn't decide to join the empire, as a vassal state or subjects just to spare lives from being lost. It still surprised him that they were more willing to take a chance and resist the more powerful sad era. The mystery that surrounds the empire itself, and generally, nobody knows the exact origins of the empire besides the common belief, it being a small peaceful state or kingdom that was a victim of persecution and suffering during the conflict with the demon armies in the past. Now, it has become this bastion that carries some kind of vengefulness and chaos. Kanata shook his head, he asked himself again, why did deserve this kind of position? A young leader with a heavy burden of leading his home out of this impending doom. He did not recall himself having any ambitions of being the leader, in fact, he just wanted to help what he can. If there was ever going a person qualified to lead Quatoin then it would be from one of the great elders, though unfortunately, most of them had ascended to the afterlife. And furthermore, due to the ongoing struggles, most of the good men, who could take on the job had perished. He sighed again as he tried to focus on his task. Kanata went through more papers and letters, make sense of them and eventually signing them until he suddenly caught a glimpse of a certain envelope almost buried by the stack of papers. It was a simple light brown envelope with a circular red seal on the middle. He widened his eyes in surprise upon seeing the illustration of the two fire-breathing creatures surrounding a tower in the middle. He calmed himself down and assumed that another invitation or an important telegram had been sent once again. And at the same time, in the midst of the silence, the elf's eyes then turned towards the nearby window, sensing a small presence from there. He stood up from his desk and approached the window, finally spotting a black crow that found itself landing there. He stared briefly at the bird, which struck worry to him, making him wonder what kind of threat would befall the city. It's known to be a symbol of death or a sign that something horrible would happen. At that moment as well, the elf heard a sudden knock from the door, and he shifted his attention towards the new presence that entered the room. The first thing he noticed was the young woman's smile, followed by the long flowing smooth black hair and lastly the relaxed bunny ears that she possessed. Like many of her kind, she naturally had that hospitable and professional aura. When she was asked if she was still affiliated with her home, she remained quiet about it and told them that she was starting a new chapter of her life. 
Kanata raised both eyebrows in surprise yet welcomed her presence. Parna, what brings you here? He asked. The young warrior bunny continued her smile. Prime Minister Kanata, I believe they need your presence for a couple of diplomatic meetings, she informed. It's very urgent and important, she added. The elf blinked a couple of times. Rarely he was called for these kinds of situations unless it was something that is critical. I see, he replied as he went back to his desk. May I ask, to whom Rinsui and our diplomats are speaking this time? He then asked. The first envoy hails from Sadera according to Sir Rinsui. She explained, causing the elf to widen his eyes in surprise. They are being led by the princess herself. She continued to elaborate. Kanata felt a sense of relief when the warrior bunny mentioned a certain princess, who lived on advocacy for peace and change. He knew her personally and was now looking forward to meeting her again. What about the other one? He then asked. A brief moment of silence passed by. Well, it's an envoy very different from the rest, and they claim to be from the Alnus region, and they all rode in some kind of horseless moving carriages made of iron. The warrior bunny explained. The elf's curiosity peaked, and he began to wonder. I see, he said before taking a deep breath. All right then, please tell the members of our diplomatic team to entertain the second Anva and also instruct them to inform Princess Pina that I'll be there in a few minutes, he said. As you wish, Sir Kanata. Parna smiled and slightly bowed before leaving the room. Now alone once again. Kanata looked back towards the window to see the crow finally gone. He then shifted to his desk again to see the envelope still there. As much as he wanted to open and check its contents, he had no choice but to let it go first since he had to attend to more important matters. Soon enough, he finally walked towards the door and left the room altogether. Ignoring the certain envelope bearing the seal of an empire hailing across the Orient, and towards the north. A seal representing the Paropedia Empire. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
His statement had slightly annoyed the teen, and he did not hesitate to speak up. Oh come on old man, don't leave us behind like this, he protested. You promised you were going to guide us to the exact place. Giselle could only sigh, knowing that a minor squabble had broken out between the two knuckleheads, and she was at a loss for words. Hey kid, even though I am not mortal, I still have my own responsibilities and duties. He responded, You are aware that my job is to help adventurers like you find a purpose in life. So be thankful that I even used my valuable time to bring you two here, he continued. Albrecht, in turn ignored most of the old man's statement. Doesn't matter. You made your promise, and he was then cut by the draconian apostle, who had briefly covered his lips to prevent him from speaking further. The youngster frowned but remained silent behind his friend. He couldn't help but scream his frustrations to himself until something flew by and grabbed his belongings. He secretly and quickly left the scene, forgetting to inform the apostle and the old man, who were still not aware of what just happened. It's all right, Bacchus. We can take it from here, Giselle calmly said. Are you sure this map of yours could direct us to your friend? She then asked letting go of the boy and making sure he wouldn't interfere yet again. The old man confidently smirked. Of course, I know what I'm giving, he remarked before adding. Just make sure you complete your goals here as smoothly as possible, he explained. We don't want any innocent people getting involved in this fiasco. The draconian apostle remained silent, remembering her failure to save an elven village in the Koan forest. By the time she arrived, it was too late for her to see the burnout ruins of the village and the lives lost within it. I know. Giselle simply nodded in response, her gaze fixed on the old man. I hope after this, you'll be here to take Albrecht back to his home if something happens or the situation calls for it, she explained, her voice tense. Bacchus simply smiled as he placed a hand on the young apostle's shoulder. Don't worry about it, he assured her as he returned to the front seat of the carriage. And I know you'll get through this, he added. Not too long, the old man left along with his carriage, leaving the young lady to finally focus on the first phase of her mission. A small smile crept across Giselle's lips as she then turned to give the young boy a little scolding but by the time she turned around, he was nowhere to be found. Albrecht? She muttered his name while raising both eyebrows in surprise. Now where the heck is that brat? She thought as worry began to set in. Giselle began to look around his surroundings only to see a growing sea of the crowd in front of her, and panic and frustration had settled in. The young lady clutched her small bag and hurled herself into the crowd. She was then able to detect the boy's distinct odor. She kept going, following traces of his aura until she caught a glimpse of him in the middle of the crowd, chasing something. Albrecht, she exclaimed loudly, again and again in the middle of the noisy atmosphere, proceeding to take off as she tried her best to catch up with him. Along the way, she wondered what had gotten into the boy's mind for him to sneak out and leave her behind. That kind of action was definitely random and risky, and something the boy would often occasionally commit. She could only hope that he had not done something idiotic. Meanwhile, apparently, that was not the case as the boy had a different reason. Hey, that's mine. Get it back. Albrecht exclaimed on the top of his lungs, as he ran as fast as he can just to chase and catch the certain culprit, who suddenly had snatched his bag away. While he was still in a conversation with the old man prior, the boy gritted his teeth in annoyance. His blood was boiling and he didn't quite expect that he would be targeted by a pickpocket or a snatcher. Wait, crimes exist in Quatoin? Those were his initial thoughts, making him wonder if all those stories he heard from merchants and friends were all true. He was looking all the way up while slightly shoving several people to get an advantage for himself. He swore that the culprit was smaller than him and moved much faster than he had expected. He kept his eyes locked on the target, and eventually he managed to get a look at the culprit's appearance. A fairy? 
he muttered to himself, as he then made a right turn to a small narrow street, still keeping track of it. The culprit, which turned out to be a female fairy, carried the bag and flew towards a certain destination, and her actions were seen to be on purpose. She knew what she was doing. The small narrow street to which she had entered was quieter and less chaotic than the main streets she had been to. As she continued to fly, she also glanced behind to see that the boy was still following her. She smirked, knowing that her plan had succeeded. Only a few distances away, she was now closing in at her destination. Albrecht, on the other hand, was gaining ground but only after witnessing the fairy enter a specific structure after unexpectedly dropping the bag on the ground. The boy halted immediately as soon he finally reached his prized possession. He quickly grabbed the bag, opened it, and checked whether if some of his own items were taken or lost, and to his relief, all of them were in one piece. His mind now was shifting towards the culprit, and he won't stop just to get some justice for the latter's actions. Apparently, a two-story wooden shop house stood before him. Albrecht's eyes were filled with confusion at first, but he soon realized that the fairy had taken sanctuary and was now hiding inside this establishment. Trying to hide from me, huh? He said sarcastically, smirking in confidence. The decision had been made, and he wanted to confront it. But before he could enter, he was immediately seized and pulled by someone. Where the heck are you going? Apparently, Giselle had finally caught up with him. The draconian apostle bore weariness and frustration on her eyes. The boy widened his eyes in surprise, instantly realizing what he had done. Hold on, I can explain everything, Giselle. He raised both his hands and pleaded. Some jerk fairy snatched my bag and I had to chase her around. He explained as best as he could. Although, Giselle was not buying it. Damn it, Albrecht. You should have told me first. She argued back. You almost caused the scene out there, and you almost got hurt. She added before sighing. Albrecht, on the other hand, had let his confidence take over. So he waved it off and remarked, Don't worry. I've been in similar circumstances before. And besides, as he was about to continue, the kid was abruptly stopped off as the doors to the Shaw house opened. Oh! New customers, Naya! Came out a beautiful young cat lady donning a simple but formal attire, with an optimistic and excited expression. The two stared at the newcomer in surprise, not exactly expecting her presence. A few moments of awkward silence had passed, and Albrecht was the first one to speak up. Um, excuse me, but I am looking for a fairy that entered inside this shop and once again, Giselle interfered and covered his mouth. Oh, I am so sorry about my friend here, but we are kinda lost right now. The young apostle explained, with an apologetic look. Oh, I see, is this your first time in the city, Naya? The cat demi-human lady curiously asked. What can I do to help? Giselle responded with a polite chuckle. Well, we are looking for a person named Anna and she is somewhat an owner of an inn called the Lost Lamb. She explained, drawing out a piece of parchment. The boy simply nodded and remarked. Yeah, our friend told us that she had a place for us to stay. After hearing both of their statements, the cat girl's eyes widened in surprise. Oh. So you're the ones that Ms. Anna is expecting? She then pointed towards the two. Um, yes? Giselle replied, unsure of what to say. My name is Selena and you're in the right place. She then cheerfully said, Welcome to the Lost Lamb. You've got to be kidding me. The boy muttered aloud, being more astonished right now. And please understand that sometimes our staff would be committing such acts just to attract potential customers. She then explained, finally revealing the true intentions of the fairy. We just relocated our main establishment in my heart, and as she was about to continue her words, the door to the shop bursts open once again, and a young man with donkey-like ears wearing some kind of white uniform stumbled towards the ground in a hurry. And get the fuck out of here! Another voice was heard, 
this time more colorful and raging. A few moments later, an older blonde-haired man, in the same attire emerged from the door, carrying what appeared to be a metallic spatula. You fucking donkey, you aren't supposed to put a sack of red chilies on the fucking soup, the man roared. We are not fucking serial killers, you bozo. What kind of an idiot are you? I promise you, I know what I am doing, the younger man exclaimed while preparing to run away. Ah, uh, stop fucking around, I know you are from that other restaurant across the street, pretending to be jobless. The blonde man replied, pointing at the demi-human, trying to sabotage us I. The demi-human narrowed his eyes. So what? He fired back. Do you think you could just take all our customers and patrons away? You thief. The blonde man rolled his eyes. Oh come on, blame your manager, who doesn't even know what soup of the day is. He replied back. That's why your fucking restaurant is sinking to the ground. Literally. The demi-human growled in return. Mark my words, I'll see to it that my manager knows this. He then said. And we'll be back stronger than ever. With that said, the demi-human left the area, giving one more confident and arrogant laugh. The blonde man could only smirk and shook his head in amusement. What a fucking idiot, he muttered aloud, as he proceeded to go back inside, but not before glancing at the two strangers, who had the most shocked and speechless expressions. After that, the man eventually went back inside to continue his services and finally cook the next dishes ordered by the surprised customers. Silence took over once again. Giselle and Albrecht couldn't comprehend what they had just witnessed. The scene happened so fast and quickly that they didn't have the time to speak and ask questions. Um, what the heck just happened? Giselle then said. Oh, don't worry, it happens all the time. The cat girl, Selena explained in a casual and jolly manner. We often get spied on by other competitors, she added, and sometimes they would cause trouble. The boy then raised his hand. And who's that angry geezer by the way? He asked as his curiosity began to peak regarding the mystery man's identity. The cat girl, in turn, was overcome by surprise and confusion. Oh, you don't know who he is? Selena raised both of her eyebrows and asked, receiving silence from the two. Does fiery cook of the Orient ring a bell? She continued to give hints. Sorry, we don't know who that man is. How about the one that invented the lamb sauce Naya? No. Master chef of the universe? No. He is known for introducing his beef wellington dish in the continent. We don't really know. Okay. He loves to visit inns, taverns, cafes, argues with the owners, and then fixes entirely the establishment in just a few days. None of the two said a word this time, causing the cat girl to sigh and finally give up. By this point, she had no choice but to just tell the man's full name to them. She won't give up just yet. All right. His name is Sir Gordon Ramsay and he's the greatest person to ever exist in this world. She finally said it, albeit making the introduction a little bit more exaggerated. She was confident that by mentioning his boss's name that the two would finally be enlightened and recognize the man who had ushered in the recent food revolution across the continent. Quietness would soon take over, and as her anticipation grew, she received the two's final response and reaction. In unison, both Giselle and Albrecht uttered the words, Gordon who? Chapter end. And, and alas, Gordon Ramsay has finally made his debut and he has a restaurant in my heart in the Quatoin Principality. For starters, I really didn't exactly know how he'll make his entrance. Some suggested for Hitoshi, Yuji, or any of the main characters to meet him first, which I originally planned, but when I connected the scenes, it didn't really result in a smooth flow. So in the end, the first meeting would go between Team Giselle and him. The last chapter also showed their old friend, Bacchus, informing them of a friend from my heart that could provide them a place to stay, and who turned out to be cafe owner Anna, from the side story. 
Though don't worry, I am still brainstorming ideas on how Team Coalition will meet the great Ramsey. And if you have ideas feel free to share. So with the rest of the chapter, so far this is more of an introductory chapter to the main arc, which is noble city more world building such as how the people of the city lived. In harmony despite the ongoing threats from the enemy outside. As well as the runes, I did add that specific scene, since, in the original series, magical items were rarely explored and were just for display, and furthermore, the JSDF didn't fully use items such as water runes and such to their advantage like they could have used it as emergency purposes whenever they ran out of water during reconnaissance missions. Magic could really have a role in both original series, but sadly it's been buried beneath. So character perspectives remain close and personal, but I tried to combine some perspectives into one scene. I hope it blended well. So far, familiar characters are back again, and besides Team Coalition, Team Pina, and Team Giselle, NHS characters finally make their debuts such as Ione, General Hanky, and Prime Minister Kanata. I tried to flesh out more about their past, connecting Ione and General Hanky. As this mentor and apprentice, Kanata as this young leader struggling to keep his nation intact. Moreover, the new diplomat characters from the coalition will make their debut next chapter. Speaking of lore and plot, there are a couple of scenes that add more mystery and build up the tension as the arc progresses. As for Parna, I kinda noticed that her character in the OG is kinda wasted so I was thinking if I could give her a chance and role in this arc, just to have an idea that explains why she is in cutie. Hopefully, I could write the next scenes before I go to my first on-the-job training. Life after college is really tough. With that said, thank you very much for spending time to read the chapter. I really appreciate it. I apologize for any grammar slash spelling mistakes since English is not my main language. Thank you so much and best wishes. 15. Arc 2. Noble City 2. Disclaimer. I don't own Gate or Nyankoku Shokan as it belongs to its rightful owners. Arc 2. A City. A Diplomacy A Dragon. Noble City 2. Goals, Talks, and Secrets. Refugee Town. Alnus Region. The sun was just rising when the elf man had found himself in the middle of the main road surrounded by the newly sturdy structures which were now converted into small establishments and managed by the displaced villagers. His stomach continued to growl as he continued to search for the specific structure to which the old man had told him. It's been a while since had got out of his new home and he was a bit impressed to see that the place was continuously prospering as weeks passed by. Alas, the circular dome-like structure located near the main plaza greeted him. Known simply as the dining hall, the establishment which was set up by the otherworlders quickly became popular among the majority of the villagers. Aside from the great ambience of the place, which was also frequented by the men in green, it was the unique and somewhat delicious food that piqued his interest. Specifically a dish simply known as pancakes accompanied by a brown thick sweet syrup and salted butter on top. And before long he was sharing a table with an old friend. Kato couldn't help but smile at the situation that he was in. It was near perfect since he finally found a place offering a certain hot drink which he had been craving for a long time and also a drink that a certain apostle didn't much like. The fragrant scent of the kaffa lingered, and he sipped it quickly while enjoying the cool morning breeze. It's been a while since I've had this hot drink, Cato remarked. I had no idea the men in green had supplies, though they called it coffee instead of the name I'm familiar with. The elf man nodded in return, and it's been a while since I had a good breakfast, he explained taking a bite of the soft delicious cake. I must say that these pancakes are impressive, he commented. The old man chuckled in return. I take it as you have finally settled down in your new life here, he then said. The smile slowly disappeared as the man sighed back. I'm doing my best, and it's been difficult not to think about my own daughter since she left to volunteer for that mission, 
he explained, staring at the blank space. In addition, some of the men in green would need my expertise to guide some of their soldiers to the western regions. I see. What about you then? Cato simply nodded. Very much the same as you. He then smiled at his friend. I still worry about my student even though she's in safe hands with them. He added. But don't assume me wrong. My trust is still full with them. Though, it's possible for trouble to follow them. Silence took charge once more. Hodder nodded in understanding, still feeling a little regret for not volunteering to protect his daughter, though there was a part of him that wanted to trust the promise that she made towards him. I'll be all right. A phrase that he used to hear from his late wife. He sighed again. Let's face it, no matter what the principality does, the enemy is going always going to find a way to infiltrate and spread its influence. He then commented, It's a good decision for the men in green to head off earlier, or else it will be too late. It wasn't always the usual show of force or a full-on aggression tactic that many kingdoms had been using for the past centuries. When there's no other option left, their old ways would be their best way to create a good illusion or image, and then in turn they would win more of their trust and capture the hardest of all hearts. They were no stranger to peace, which used to be their former hearts. Cato slightly smiled. They are really that committed to their own ambitions just to claim that power. He remarked to himself while moving his eyes towards the morning sky. He remembered a certain memory, and how long it has been since he visited the small kingdom that would eventually become consumed by the dark influence. And the little red-haired girl who made her promise to lead her home to a path of greatness. Who else would the empire turn to now at this desperate times? XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
though it finally put to rest the rumors of countless staff throwing various flower petals or roses at her as she passed through the corridors or met an official surrounded by a large audience. The person in front of her was different than he had been expecting. Jaga flashed a small smile as he greeted her. Wondrous day, Princess Pina. We are quite not expecting your surprise visit. The man was in good spirits despite the workload he had to endure. He was part of the principality's diplomatic team in charge to meet the representatives of their neighbors, though was not expecting to be part of meeting the delegates from the supposed aggressor. However, the individuals around him were in a different mindset, particularly his superiors, who were unsure and disappointed. The young lady did briefly acknowledge his greeting but mainly focused on the matter at hand. It was just a few moments later that her brown-haired companion spoke out. All right then. She cleared her throat, catching the rest of everyone's attention. I presume that you were all informed regarding our intentions here and that is to spearhead the first peace talks between our two kingdoms. She announced. A brief moment of silence followed as the men began to wonder. Peace talks? When did Sadera decide to end the madness? Hamilton went on. When I said peace talks, I meant that this would offer us an opportunity to prevent the loss of more lives, she said, clutching a piece of paper with the crucial facts of their plan. We are confident that our proposal will ease the burdens of your kingdom, and the great emperor has now assured us that all of you will benefit greatly. She added with a small smile. Pina slightly grimaced at the mention of the old man. Preventing innocent deaths through a merger? One of the old councilmen inquired. It seems as if you are attempting to demonstrate that we have no choice but to accept your terms immediately. Hamilton was a bit taken aback by the statement. That's not what I meant. She thought to herself. There must be some misinterpretation. As she was going to speak, her red-haired partner raised her hand and expressed her own thoughts. Just to be clear, we respect your own opinions and discussions about the ongoing conflict, Pina continued. However, I am informing you all that there are great changes within Sad Era that will finally put an end to this senseless chaos, she added, raising her emotions to a new level. Please hear us first. Silence reigned once more despite the fact that her latest remarks had caught their attention, and the older elves remained suspicious and alert. Pina continued to smile, signaling Hamilton to bring up their proposal. The young lady simply nodded and spoke. We'll keep it short and to the point, she said, and we think it's best for you all to know what they're planning ahead. As of this month, the kingdoms of Akasha and the dukedom of Valda had been reclaimed following the death of General Ruga, she said. Correct me if I am wrong, but according to our own intelligence reports, these kingdoms struck a deal that they will protect whatever territory you had, and in exchange, you will provide them with supplies from your blessed farms. She paused for a few moments. The men in front of them were quiet. They could have denied such information but the majority of their guilt eventually overcame them. Their latest actions, which included cutting any important highways or networks, appear to have resulted in the fall of these kingdoms. Furthermore, these kingdoms were located close to the principality's borders, around the town of Jim and the walled city of Ajay. Jaga was taken aback by the news. They seized both of those kingdoms in a few weeks, he questioned. On the other hand, one of the Quatoin officials came up, asking, So what's in it for you that these kingdoms were taken? One of the cabinet members this time retorted angrily, recalling some loved ones who lived there. Don't tell me you're simply come to brag about your empire's achievements in front of us, he exclaimed. Hamilton slightly gulped as she tried to explain her side. Sir I but was then cut. We will never forget the atrocities committed by those hellish Sadran soldiers of yours, especially treating them as if they were sacrificed to the demon god. The man was now raising his voice, and for the first time, he was able to vent his frustrations in front of the empire's ostensibly important figures. Pina felt taken aback by the statement. 
She knew that the people serving the army would never do such inhuman acts though. That was before Adam had taken over. She was aware of the atrocities committed until now. She took a deep breath. That is why we are here to prevent such actions from happening again, she stated. I promise you my word that no one will suffer the same fate again. And I assure you that the other kingdoms will be treated properly, she continued. Please, if you would all just listen. She was met with silence once more, which did not fully alleviate their moods. But she decided to let them continue before signaling to her companion to do so. Hamilton cleared her throat as she began reading the details of their proposal. There are only three important things that you should take note of, she explained. And the first one would be that if you concede and let this conflict come to pass, the Empire would not destroy any of your cultures and treasures, she announced to the men. Her Highness has taken efforts and had gained a high ground in the Senate, and from these, she will guarantee that no official or even the ones that resist would be not tortured or put to the cages. Hamilton added, and continued, Furthermore, the princess would ensure that all demi-humans would be treated fairly during this process. As the men began to assimilate more knowledge, silence took over once more. Some simply could not accept it all since it seemed too far-fetched to be realized or implemented. Yagu, on the other hand, was interested in the details as the empire would not go to such efforts to acquire their trust. However, another uncertainty lingered. How can you be so certain that they aren't just lies? Inquired another Quatoin official, raising an eyebrow. Pina nodded slightly. The kingdoms of Elba and Mudwan, she replied. Have they been completely destroyed and remade into something that isn't their own selves? She followed up. Have they been turned into mere puppets? She asked. Another silence followed. No, they are still able to retain their self-governance and live their own lives normally, the young lady explained. And they would never have to be forcefully involved in wars now. Truth to be told, the kingdoms were once allies of the principality. And when the empire began its conquest, the country took certain measures in order to just survive. The men had guilt in their eyes, though there was something inside them that continued to resist the temptation. In the coming weeks, Satyr's first general election will be held, and if Her Highness wins and is chosen as the new empress she will guarantee all of these promises, Hamilton explained, and even coordinate with the other kingdoms, including yours, to have a safe transition to immediate independence. It was the highlight of the meeting. A Sardran princess offering a path to freedom, and they all wondered why she would go to such actions. From the center of the delegation, Prime Minister Kanata sat in silence, keeping a straight face as he tried to understand her goals. His worry was what if the princess did not win, and one of her brothers were instead. Sure, they could turn into puppets in the end. Perhaps she saw the evil doings in her home and has vowed to stop it from whatever power she had. Yet why does the empire keep on invading and conquering every kingdom it came across? The Sadran higher officials believe that there's a greater threat coming from the northern land across the Orient. Hamilton said this time, that is why they are trying to unify the kingdoms and the continent into one, in order to combat the threat. However, we believe that maintaining strong relationships and protecting one another was the best way to unify the continent rather than using harsh means. So please understand that changes will be made soon, and we need your trust. Outside of the third civilization, there were empires exploring and searching for lands to conquer and influence, and one of them was reportedly making their presence known on the continent. Such visits were nothing new to Quatoin. The majority of the delegation was put in between decisions, which made things difficult for them. Yagu was very impressed by their entire proposal, and he looked around the room for approval from his fellow delegates. This offer may be the one that could save the principality from future threats. Kanada, on the other hand, remained optimistic but pessimistic. Despite the fact that he could see the truth and desire in the young lady's eyes, 
a part of him was still preventing him from making the final decision. What if this was only a ruse for them to infiltrate and claim it? Before he could speak, the rest of the men beat him to it, starting with a fellow older colleague. Your Highness, I must say that your offer is generous and brilliant but, he took a deep breath. We don't know if we could fully accept these terms, he replied. It will only show that we have betrayed the other kingdoms, who are desperate for assistance, he added, though there was something more to it than his decision. So it is possible that we will continue to fight rather than become traitors to our ancestors. Pina's eyes widened surprised as soon as she heard his statement. She shook her head in denial. With all due respect, sir, there must be another way you would reconsider it. She then started pleading, this is the best way we can achieve both solutions to our own conflicts. She was received by silence, and her brown-haired companion gave her a look of concern. The Quatoin representatives just stared at her. All of them had the same hardened yet anxious expression. Their thoughts were aligned and they remembered their vow and the secret contained within the principality. I am very sorry, your highness, but we cannot agree with your terms. Rinsui spoke this time with a solemn voice. The confusion and puzzlement continued to bother the young lady's mind. What was going on? What was going through their heads? It seemed that they are keener to refuse the only answer that could perhaps stop this conflict and spare the lives of many innocents. They are completely aware of it. Pina was carrying the fate of this kingdom, and if she failed this that Adam and his puppets would eventually execute their plan of a full-on invasion from the skies and ground. She was now screaming from within and wanted to voice out her reasons towards the men. As her desire grew, small tears began to fall from her eyes, and yet she chose to stay calm and remain firm. Please, I am begging you. She said aloud, her eyes being filled with small tears. Give us a chance to make things right. She added, on behalf of what my home has done, I apologize for that. The chapel bells rang just as she ended her statement. The hall was once again dominated by silence. Hamilton quickly stood up and immediately comforted her friend. For the first time, Pina felt this sense of grief from within as she sat down on her seat. While the other men kept silent, Jagger expressed his sympathy to the young lady. It seemed as if she was all alone keeping the situation from breaking apart. He shifted his focus towards his older colleagues, who were trying their best to stay emotionless. As time continued to pass by, the royal representatives of Sad Era were nearing their decision to leave the hall. But in a sudden twist, the young prime minister spoke. Very well then. We might accept your proposal, but we need more time to think about it first, he explained, looking at the princess and leading the rest of the elder advisors to look at him with a puzzled expression. But sir, another official tried to interrupt only to face his hand. Kanata took a deep breath. You're welcome to remain here for a day or two, he said. Though my only request is to revise your proposal and make sure that both sides would not claim any loss. He explained. Silence followed thereafter. Pina felt relief inside as she found herself astonished by his statement. He was certainly different than she had expected. T thank you sir. She muttered in disbelief while still trying to absorb the information. As the sounds of the chapel bells ended. The young lady stood up from her seat. I look forward to the next meeting tomorrow. She informed them before turning towards the massive doors. Hamilton quickly followed, but not before bowing slightly and departing with her. Their brains were distracted by the one thought of not squandering the next opportunity that came their way. They promised to return the next time and ensure that both parties agreed on the arrangements. Unbeknownst to them that the certain bunny warrior servant had been staring and observing them the whole time. Once the two royals had left the meeting hall, the rest of the men exploded in frustration towards him. Are you out of your mind, Kanada? One of the elder officials remarked, staring furiously at the young elf. Do you think they will fulfill those promises? The princess may have good intentions but at the end of the day, she is still a puppet. 
Another one commented. The young prime minister could only sigh. There's truth in her eyes. And also she doesn't know a single thing about it. It still doesn't matter. Have you forgotten that our role is to keep it hidden from them? The older man retorted. Even if they are good people or are unaware of it. The young prime minister expressed a serious look. How long can we bear this burden while other places that carry the likes of it are destroyed? He asked, causing the rest to widen their eyes. We won't survive this long even if the forest god's blessing remains to feed our people, he added, or ensure safety and protection. They had to at least do something other than forcefully avoid the ordeal at all costs. At that very moment, the doors opened once again and a servant had emerged bearing the news. The diplomatic envoy from the Alnus region has arrived. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
but this was the first time he'd seen her do so. Anada wa nihango o hanashimasuka, he asked in his own dialect, as excitement filled his eyes. Rory continued to smile. Shojiki and I ayutu, iga no tamamono de watashi o shukufuku shite kurita kami no kosiki o tedi. Sekai no samazamana gurupa tekantan and I kamihunikshan o toru koto jie dekamashida. She explained in perfect Nihango, before shifting his gaze to another direction. Though, I had to be respectful since your colleague is going to be left behind, she said, referring to the other diplomat. The still perplexed Japanese diplomat nodded, turning to face his colleague, who seemed unconcerned about the entire situation. A lovely blonde four-eyed woman sat next to him. She remained mostly silent throughout, but would interject with her own observations whenever the situation called for it. Her hair was pulled back into a ponytail as she waited for their call. Though, having been mentioned by her colleague, she shifted her gaze and showed her calm and firm expression. My name is Diane Kelly, but you can call me Diane for short. Quick and abrupt as she replied back. Rory noticed her shyness right away. She didn't detect any fear in the young woman, but there was a hint that she really wanted to make friends with new people but didn't know how. It reminded her of a certain friend from her younger days. Calm, silent, and conservative. She's a bit shy. The Japanese diplomat remarked with a slight grin, that unbeknownst to him, his fellow colleague had reacted and frowned at his statement. Rory gave a small chuckle as she turned towards the American diplomat. Nice to meet you, Diane, she warmly smiled. Yet, she received another silence and nod. As much as she wanted to get to know the young woman, the conversation quickly shifted to another topic. So Ms. Rory, what brings you here along with the rest of the team in this? Kwatoin Principality? Representative Tanaka then asked. For a brief moment, the apostle cast a glance at a particular illustration painted on one of the corridor's walls. That one symbol, in particular, embedded on one illustration of a divine being. Well, aside from being one of your guides, I volunteered to join so that you could enter the city without having to face any kind of struggle, she explained, looking up. Though the merchant had everything handled at the gates. I believe one envoy should have at least one apostle by their side. Ambassador Tanaka widened his eyes in curiosity. Interesting, how important is an apostle in this world? He asked. Quietness took over, as Rory seemed to have been in a small struggle thinking about her own kind. Apostles are holy ambassadors of the gods acknowledged and believed by many kingdoms, she explained. For example, a certain envoy with an apostle also representing them signifies they are to be treated seriously. The man simply nodded. So if an apostle is with an envoy from any kingdom or small community, he trailed off, almost figuring it out. Then that means that apostle is supporting that community and is believing them to be worthy enough as a group with their own identity and culture? More like that. We're only obeying our own master's orders to personally give them the blessings they deserved, the young lady added, referring to both of the delegates. Just like the nations you both lived in, she added. My God saw them as something that could help stop the conflict plaguing this land. And personally I believe that your intentions in this world are good. Representative Tanaka blinked a couple of times, wondering if that is her main reason for joining their side. Rory had a lot of things she wanted to say, but she chose to only reveal the main goals of her church. As her thoughts changed, her once confident smile shifted to solemnity. It was that loneliness that she had tried to avoid countless of times, and in a very rare moment, she began to doubt the role she had played for a long time. Yes, it brought her family back from hardship, and it gave her a reason to continue living for them. Most of her own kind had that same motivation, and that eventually faded away and led to their demise. Ms. Rory, is it true that you are the last apostle in this world? The question surprisingly came from the American woman as Representative Kelly had been listening to this whole time. 
Rory's eyes widened in surprise before she chuckled, No, Ms. Kelly. She then shook her head, I am quite fortunate to inform you all that we are still here to protect our people. Underneath that facade, the young lady still wanted to believe, and at the same time, the doors to the meeting hall finally opened, allowing certain individuals to emerge. X X X X X X X X X X X X X The walls and paintings looked as if they were alive and moving. Almost every wall and every area they passed through had some sort of illustration on it. Even in the massive pillars that kept the place standing, Yuji had spent the rest of his time observing the illustrations. There was something about them that piqued his interest. One of the clues that had struck him was that the drawings were in a specific order. They do, however, tell different stories after each sequence concludes. So they are like one-shot manga stories painted in a Renaissance-style art? Itami couldn't think of anything else to say other than his own description of what he was seeing. Every time, he would compare it to what he was used to or grew up with. Pretty accurate, man, Yuji remarked with a small chuckle, as he began taking several photos of the illustrations for his own study. Of course, the hallway was large but he only went to the ones he found interesting. His friend decided to accompany him for a short time because there was still a meeting going on behind the doors of the main room, and the American lieutenant was also conversing with one of the palace officials. So, what do they mean? Itami, who was now engrossed in whatever lore was in front of him, inquired. The otaku lieutenant attempted to interpret the illustrations several times but the story became more complex along the way. Well, I did ask some of the guards, and they only told me that these are accounts of various people who lived throughout the centuries, Yuji explained, taking another photograph of a dark dragon emerging from a massive volcano. Oh, so pretty much one-shots based entirely on true stories, Itami remarked casually as he continued to observe the walls. I've got a feeling all these witnesses are either painters or artists, he added. The illustrations could literally be mistaken as something that came from major museums back in their world. Well, from what I've heard, palace officials commissioned a lot of artists to reimagine these people's stories into these walls so that everyone could remember the events and also honor their contributions, Yuji explained once more. Itami nodded in understanding. So it's a memorial of heroes as well. He then commented with a slightly amazed expression. That's pretty cool. Actually, he then said. Yuji smiled back, still in awe of the palace's rich art and history. The two men arrived at the final area, which housed the final illustrations, after finishing their tour. It was specifically near the main hallway where the doors to the meeting hall were located. They both came to a halt there passing by the sun's rays that penetrated through the windows, and moments later, they finally came face to face with the final illustration, which turned out to be an alone painting, and this time it gave them a kind of energy and emotion that they were not expecting. It looked as if it was the only illustration that had not been maintained and actually showed how old it was. The foundations were fading away, yet fortunately, the whole thing was still intact and readable. Yuji found himself staring at the painting, which appeared to depict a man and the rest of his family, for several minutes. They were all dressed elegantly, which led him to believe they were of royal blood or descent. Aside from the man and his wife, there were two boys and a girl in front of them. The girl had the brightest smile of them all. Behind the family was the huge facade of their kingdom that towered above them, and the mystery that filled the whole thing. He could sense the conflicting emotions emanating from it. The man wasn't sure if he was lonely about it or basking in the joy that filled the happy family, but his mind kept wondering how this family was even connected to the previous stories. His thoughts were interrupted at that precise moment when the doors finally opened. X X X X X X X X X X X. Everyone's attention shifted towards the new ongoing scene as a group of people emerged from the massive doors. Two beautiful young women were surrounded by a number of guards, as they were carefully being escorted to their destination. 
both walked in silence passing by the curious looks of everyone on the team. All eyes were on them, especially Yuji, who caught a glimpse of a certain red-haired woman. His world began to slow down in those moments, and he was able to see what her face fully looked like. He widened his eyes and gaped in awe. She was indeed beautiful yet there was a mystery surrounding her. Who are they? Itami spoke. Her own curiosity had taken over. Yuji's only response was a shrug. He tried unsuccessfully to find any significant marks or symbols in their armor and clothing. Unlike the other groups they had encountered before, there was no small flag to represent the nation or kingdom from which they came. The only logical explanation he could think of was that these people were so important that they needed to be protected in this way, even if it meant concealing their true identities. As he continued to observe them, especially the red-haired lady, the young writer noticed the restlessness in her eyes and the sadness that followed up after. What had she gone through beyond those doors? What did she fight for that eventually led to some kind of disappointment? Lastly, was she really alright? Meanwhile just across from where they were standing, where the two representatives and the apostle, who were also observing the little scene unfold. Is it just me, or are their escorts a little too many? The Japanese diplomat remarked, noting the number of guards surrounding them. And the girls looked like they just started college. Representative Kelly muttered, noting the ladies' ages and appearance. Do you know them, Ms. Rory? Representative Tanaka then turned towards the apostle and asked. Rory simply smiled in return, as certain memories of a place she had visited before returned. She was indeed surprised to see them finally grown up, yet there was something off to which she had noticed. They are representatives of a kingdom hailing from the north. She explained before adding, Just like any other groups here, they are pursuing peace and an end to the war. I see. The apostle nodded, and in the back of her mind, she wasn't referring to the current incarnation of the kingdom, but only the one she personally knew back then. Just as they left the scene, a certain official emerged from the doors and stood in front of the coalition Anva. Representatives from Alnus, welcome. Her voice rang through their ears as they turned to face her. Giving a slight bow as a sign of greeting, the black-haired bunny warrior smiled. They are now expecting you, she added, giving the other official a look, before leaving the scene once again. The official, who first guided them across the palace then cleared his throat. Please follow Ms. Parna, he informed them. She will be the one to guide you now. Once he made the announcement, the rest of the team hurried from their previous positions and soon followed the young woman. Rory, who was further behind expressed a small smile looking forward to the talks and as well as the person she had been searching for a long time. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
Hitoshi and Tomita remained silent albeit with their own sweats dropping, in the midst of the little clash between their fellow JSDF members. From being a little dumbfounded at first, the busty young Japanese woman soon came into full realization, and the moment her fellow friends slash members saw her monstrous and intimidating face, both of them quickly raised their hands up and nervously apologized. Hey chill down, Shino, we were just trying to ouch. Karada and Higashi both cringed in pain as they rubbed their arms as a result of the young woman pinching them together with both of her hands, which was not something she did often. You're lucky that I didn't smack both of your heads, Shino remarked with a smirk. Sht, Kuwahara could only sigh. The older man then shifted his attention towards the blue-haired mage and the elf girl, who were also in the middle of their own conversations. His mind went back to the time he first received the objectives and he still couldn't believe that their requests would be granted by his superiors. He took a deep breath and cleared his throat. All right, settle down, he announced to the group, as they all seriously stood straight and stay quiet. In accordance to what Captain Itami and I had discussed, he said eyeing the rest of them, all of you that called here would be taking on a little side mission in escorting our fellow friends here, he explained. Is that understood? Yes, sir. The older man then nodded. Very well then, Kurabayashi, Karada and Higashi. The three of you are assigned in escorting Ms. Tuka here to the place where her relatives are currently residing, he explained. The rest of the trio then turned towards the elf girl who could only smile and waved her hand in return. Sht. Kuwahara took another deep breath as he then eyed the second group. Furuta and Tomita, you three are assigned to escort Ms. Lele here to the Grand Library. The man then said, A library? Both of the younger men raised their eyebrows in confusion as they took a glance at the blue-haired teen. Seriously, what could they gain from a library? The Japanese man simply nodded. Yes, and each group will be also guided by an additional asset from the Quatoin Knights, he added, so that you won't get yourselves lost in the city, he explained. Fortunately, two men who work as messengers for the Knights were assigned to the team. They were born and raised in the city their entire lives, and they are more familiar with the streets and neighborhoods. Furthermore, they believed that the destinations they were going to were not too far away. So chief, are we just gonna travel on foot or use one of the LAVs? Karada had been longing to ask. A part of him was eager to explore more of the streets of the city and experience meeting the locals face to face. SGT Kuwahara shook his head slightly. Apparently time is precious private so you'll be using the LAV later on. He clarified before turning towards the rest. Are there any more questions before we end this meeting? Silence followed for a few moments until. That's all sir, Tomita spoke, sealing the agreement for the mission. The man then sighed. All right then, you may go back to your respective stations and prepare. He continued glancing at the main palace building. Once we finally settled, then you all can proceed with your objectives. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
They were also informed of their affiliation, which was supposedly neutral, and that somehow eased the tension inside the room, though little arguments were inevitable. We should have not allowed them to enter soon. What if they are just spies or pretenders? Their weapons should be confiscated and all of them interrogated first. We do not treat any delegation as criminals or enemies. Besides, our knights have said that they don't have any ill intentions. Still, we cannot give our full trust and they should never be aware of it, regardless if they have good intentions. I assure you, they have the Apostle of Emre as one of their representatives. They are blessed by one of the gods. He! The gods have no role to help us anymore nor these apostles. Voices were raised as the men continued their little debates. Clearly, everyone wanted to have a different approach to the matter. Kanata found himself in the middle of it. He looked towards Rinsui, an old friend of his father, shaking his head as he too couldn't comprehend the situation. Moments later, the doors finally opened revealing the representatives of Alnus. A young man and woman in some kind of slim black attire as were being escorted by a couple of men in the same green outfit. In addition, alongside them is the Oracle of Emra herself, in her priestess attire, and they were all being led by a certain Parna to their respective seats and tables. Prime Minister Kanata, Sir Rinsui, and Elders, I present you the delegates from Alnus. The young warrior bunny started speaking which caught the rest of their attention. Yuji moved his eyes around as he took in his new surroundings. The meeting hall was much larger than the previous ones he had seen. The illustrations had been replaced as decorations by a variety of ornaments, small statues, and bookshelves strewn about the room. A couple of massive glass windows were positioned on both sides from above allowing the sun's rays to do their job of bringing more light into the space. The smell as usual had that grand nostalgic feel to it, considering that the palace was already centuries old, and even older than Rory herself. He took a seat near the end of the table, and as he looked towards his front to set up his small recording equipment, he noticed the ceramic cups filled with hot tea. Oh, lovely! He heard the oracle whisper beside him, as he learned before that this was her favorite kind of drink. The man faintly smiled taking note of the hospitality that the people here had as, besides the tea, snacks in form of elven biscuits and surprisingly, small little strawberry cupcakes were served. Good day Mr. Prime Minister, I am Lieutenant Brian Wilson and this is Lieutenant Itami, and we are the ones leading this envo. The American soldier greeted and then informed the men. Blessed day, Lieutenant. Please enjoy the little snacks, and make yourselves comfortable first. The elven prime minister spoke for the first time with a smile, despite the weariness in his eyes. He still wanted the guests to feel welcome. The two representatives quickly understood what the elf had said and it reminded them of the strange phenomenon that had resulted in the majority of them understanding the world's language. We appreciate your warm welcome, sir, but we believe that we should start the official introductions and proceed with the main meeting. Itami raised a hand and smiled. We do have a lot of things to tell and explaining to do, he added. Surprised by the commitment and urgency of these representatives, Kanada nodded in understanding and said, Please do what you have to do. Silence reigned for a few moments, as Lieutenant Itami signaled the rest of his team to distribute several handbooks to the heads of the cabinet. The said handbooks also gave astonishment to the men, as they examined the stack of high-quality paper. The quality is amazing, one of the members of the cabinet commented. So what's the purpose of these strange books? Vinci asked. It was then Representative Tanaka cleared his throat and finally spoke. It's a guide to what our nations and world is all about, sir. He explained, causing small confusion amongst the men. Your world? One of the men inquired. If I recall correctly, we've been informed you hail from the Alnus region, which belonged to this known world. And that's already too far-fetched to believe since the region is basically forests and farms, he added. 
We were wondering how could a kingdom or country could exist there and be undetected for years. The coalition team has already been bombarded by questions that somehow could fit in an interrogation session. Yuji took note of the alertness and cautiousness of the men from the Kwatoin delegation. They seemed to be more aggressive than he had expected. As he recorded the event, he noticed the calm demeanor of the prime minister. Well, believe or not, no one would really know or discover our kingdom since the Japanese diplomat was then cut by his colleague. We are from another world. Representative Kelly spoke quickly gaining eyes on her. Quietness filled the whole room. The rest of the Kwatoin delegation stared at them, thinking if they should laugh or be furious at her statement. What do you mean that you all came from another world? Prime Minister Kanata then asked, who seemed to be more interested in the subject. Sir, Rory raised her hand as she garnered the rest of their attention. If I may ask you and your members, are you aware of the Empire sending an expedition force towards the Sacred Hill at the Alnus region? She smiled. Ugh yes, we received reports from our reconnaissance knights that a huge band of the Empire's army had journeyed to the region months ago. Rinsey spoke this time. Whatever caused them to send such an expedition is still unknown to many of us but it's said that a he was then cut. A gate leading to another world appeared on the hill itself. The oracle finished the sentence for him, hoping that some way more of them would realize it. The men stared at her in disbelief. Are you making a fool out of us? One of the older men then questioned. Rory continued to smile. I don't see any reason why should we make a fool out of you. She then said, What I'm telling you right now is nothing but the truth. The gate has returned and the gods had chosen them to be the saviors. She added, eyeing the tough eyes of the advisors. So please stop acting like paranoid nobles. Her words were already irritating some of the older men. They were aware of her proclivity to taunt others. But the young lady was being brutally honest. They just couldn't accept that the legend of the gate was indeed real. Please calm yourselves, Prime Minister Kanata exclaimed, seeing that there was already tension building in the air. The elf faintly smiled. I apologized, but if you say that you men hail from another realm beyond a gate, how can you prove it? He then asked. Quietness took over once again, as some of the coalition team knew that they had to juggle up their memory. It was then Lieutenant Brian spoke. A couple of months ago, this city had encountered something that you couldn't identify. He informed taking out a piece of paper with an image of a certain aircraft and presenting it to the men. Upon seeing the image, most of them widened their eyes in shock as the memories of witnessing a creature that they dubbed a white iron dragon resurfaced. The mysterious flying being caused a little chaos around the city and almost turned the place into a battleground. The incident to which stuck around many of their minds and was even recorded by the chroniclers of the city. So that white dragon belonged to you, Rinsui exclaimed with a slight furious face. And you're not aware of how much damage and destruction could it bring. Yes sir, though it's not exactly a dragon and it's not alive either. Itami calmly explained. It's a mode of transportation much like your wyverns, though it can accommodate multiple people, are controlled, and can take you anywhere or even higher up in the sky. He added. We call it AP3C Orion, for short. Then what or why did it trespass our airspace and territory? Another question was fired back. Itami took a deep breath as he knew this was going to be a long discussion. The aircraft was part of a reconnaissance mission sent to explore more of land and seas, he explained. And somehow our team, who was in that aircraft was able to stumble upon the city one morning. He sighed and I believed it caused a little bit of trouble when it flew over and hung around for a while. He hoped that his explanation would give light and calm the men down, and it surprisingly did. The Japanese diplomat then raised his hand and said, Together with expressing our gratitude for lending us your time, we issue an apology for our world's patrol aircraft which had violated your airspace. He apologized politely and sincerely. Quietness reigned once more in the hall, 
and while most of the delegation had calmed down, they remained on high alert. Prime Minister Kanada, on the other hand, saw the Japanese diplomats' sincerity and truthfulness. Apology accepted, though we would like to know more about your world and your purpose for being here. He then smiled. It was then the American diplomat adjusted her glasses and cleared her throat. Well, both of our nations have one goal in common, and that concerns the so-called powerful empire that has a penchant for invading and conquering everything. She explained. Rinsey then raised an eyebrow. Sadera, so it appears that the expedition army tried to invade one of your cities? Precisely. The gate opened in the middle of a bustling city in my nation and Representative Tanaka trailed off as the memories of the horrible event flashed before his eyes. There was a part of him that wanted to stop himself from continuing the story as it would only bring the pain back again. They came, killed, and kidnapped a lot of my people. The others saw and understood, especially Rory, who could only share her own sympathy with the man. Prime Minister Kanada expressed a solemn look, having figured out what possibly could have transpired during that event. We understand what you're trying to tell us, he remarked. So please, you may share us everything about your world and your culture. He then smiled wanting for this meeting not to get overwhelmed by discussions of death and horrible crimes. For Itami and Brian's part, both lieutenants then looked towards the Japanese-American writer, who also eyed and gave them a simple nod. Yuji, who was able to set up the equipment on time, turned towards the rest and called out to them. Gentlemen, if I may have your attention please. He announced as he pointed a small device towards a portable project screen. Feel free to relax and enjoy knowing more about our world. He smiled, pressing the button as the light on the screen emerged and an image of a familiar map appeared. Welcome to Earth. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
or was this just her imagination, and the latter doing everything just to prepare herself for the upcoming days? The girl shook her head and took a deep breath, grabbing the knob as she then opened the door. She smiled. Milady, I think it's time that we should pack up and... She trailed off upon being greeted by an unexpected sight. The room was empty and the princess was nowhere to be found. X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X The Quatoin delegates weren't sure if they were witnessing something entirely based on magic, or if it was just another form of powerful illusion magic. Further, observation had made them realize that no magic crystal, spell, or rune was involved. That also led them to think that maybe one of them is a high archmage that possessed newly invented incredible magical items that could project still and moving images through the stand with a giant white thin cloth at the end of the table. Although Yuji was merely operating his small laptop that projected the information through the small portable projector, he felt as if he was in a room full of curious children wanting to know more about what he was doing. So the presentation began and every necessary information was shown, even though it was the basics. A billion people living in one realm, one of the elders remarked with a very shocked expression upon seeing the numbers on the chart. The rest of the men were glued to the projector screen, seeing the different places, cities, cultures, and people that lived in the realm, and they were all humans much to their surprise. What happened to their own beast men? Does their world possess any wyverns or dragons or have they evolved into these mindless flying iron beasts? Moreover, in the way these people lived in their realm, not a single hint of slavery was there. Most of the people are treated, the respect was there, and importantly, no such conflicts were happening and people are living peaceful lives in either of these tall crystal towers or just a simple sturdy house. There were so many questions that the Prime Minister wanted to ask, especially, how their nations handle and defend their territories if ever a war transpired. What was their world's history like? He thought to himself. And how did they handle their own struggles? The moving images began to change and the white screen finally showed the military aspect of the nations, particularly the so-called Japan and the United States of America. As expected, wyverns, dragons, knights, and mages were nowhere to be found, replaced by the giant green and brown moving fortresses with long noses. Men in green and light brown outfits carry the same black artifacts. Huge battleships made in iron could even carry their large aircrafts. Metallic eagles and dragons that flew faster than any existing flying creatures in their world, and they do not breath fire. Weapons that can obliterate an entire city. It looked and felt very powerful. The rest of the coalition team stayed silent, through Lieutenant Brian's eyes. He could definitely see that the Quatoin delegates were now overwhelmed by what they are seeing right now. A small confident smile formed around his lips. As for the Oracle of Emro, she continued to enjoy her tea and the small cakes while reading a certain fantasy novel. She already figured that the cocky old men were now in disbelief. The presentation was near an end and soon as the military showcase concluded, the last segment had arrived and showed the event that started it all. The gate appears in the middle of the intersection, and the expedition armies emerge through an aggressive force, causing chaos, death, and destruction. The Prime Minister and his cabinet members were horrified by the scenes in front of them. Men, women, and children were slaughtered, some were captured, and some even transformed into golems and other forms to be used by the mages to spread the influence. The Japanese diplomat kept quiet and tried to control his own emotions. He knew it was the right thing to do to show these men why they are here in this world. It wasn't just vengeance or justice but action to finally put an end to the terror. The presentation finally ended and the moving images halted and transformed back into the blank white screen from before. Silence filled the meeting hall leaving the Quatoin delegates in shock. Most of them find it difficult to absorb the information, and some were beginning to understand and show sympathy towards the coalition. Truly, 
They haven't experienced this kind of pain and suffering for a long time, and that was due to the principality's past leaders, who were able to ensure peace without compromising anything. Nowadays, the actions that they have committed had created the cracks that would lead to their home's downfall. If they did not find a permanent solution, their minds began to imagine what a burning quatoin would look like. How would the goddess of life think about these men in green? Are they really the ones to be the last hope of this land? Prime Minister Kanata took a deep breath and eyed the two representatives. We believed you, he calmly said. Though, what could we provide in return if we accepted whatever proposal you have in store? Not so much, sir. Representative Kelly then spoke, adjusting her glasses. Our main mission is to rescue our people in this world. And now knowing more about the situation your kingdom is dealing with, we would like to establish an alliance and to also give our contributions in protecting the lives of your people, she informed. That is if you're willing to allow us to establish a base in one of your lands and full cooperation with your own military. The men began to look at each other. Slight nods were passed. This young woman started strong. Rinsey then raised a hand. If I may ask, what else do you plan on doing here? Representative Tanaka took a deep breath and gave his explanation. Well, sir, as you've stated previously, the principality is going through a difficult road of assisting displaced citizens and villagers as a result of their homes being caught in battles between it and the Sadran Empire. He continued to read the translated notes. Furthermore, your major sources of producing food around your lands have either been claimed or destroyed. He added as he continued to read the translated notes and the closure of major roads has resulted in significant delays in deploying medical assistance to soldiers and civilians who have been injured or afflicted. He paused to allow them to process the information. The men continued the guilty expressions. These were the results of the decisions they had implemented, just in order for the capital city and the essence of the place to survive. As the diplomat continued to mention all the struggles they tried to avoid not thinking, it was at that time that they realized that they actually wanted to ask for help. We want to share some of our knowledge that could help your people. That mainly includes improved medicine, better modes of transportation, electricity and if plausible weapons that could help you defend from any of the empire's attacks. And the list goes on. The Japanese representative smiled. The proposal was impressive, and it was an offer they couldn't refuse. They could eventually reveal the many locations that had been caught up in the conflict, but they needed more time to gather all of the information before handing it over. In front of them was a potential true ally that will keep its promises, though at the end line, could they be trusted with the secret? Prime Minister Kanata had been planning on telling them the truth about it, and he wanted to do it as of this moment, yet there were certain obstacles. He nodded and smiled. I would like to thank you for your wonderful proposal, and it has come to our decision that we will accept it. The members of the coalition team were then taken by surprise by their quick decision. However, I would like to request that we extend our talks, perhaps, until tomorrow for further finalization, he explained, hinting that there are some matters that he needed to attend to. Representative Tanaka gave a nod in return. Understood. Though is there something else you want to tell us? He then asked. A part of the elf felt that now was the time to tell them, and as he opened his mouth, some of the old advisors turned towards him with a warning and serious look. Mr. Tanaka, before I go, I would like to inform you about. He trailed off as he suddenly felt a sharp pain in his head. Following that, he held his head and his body began to tremble. His vision was beginning to blur, and just like that, he was collapsing. Everyone, particularly from the coalition team, was surprised and shocked to see what was going on. The guards and the cabinet members quickly rushed to the scene in order to help the young prime minister. Is he all right? Lieutenant Brian asked worriedly, as he was ready to call for backup. The two representatives were forced to stand up to check if the young leader was all right. Although, one of the old advisors stepped in and assured him. 
No need to worry, Minister Kanata will be all right. He explained without any concern while looking at the young elf man, who was now being assisted towards one of the exit doors into the palace's local clinic. Yuji, who was observing the scene noticed something suspicious in the old man's eyes before he left, and moreover, the calmness of the black-haired bunny warrior servant, who left along with the rest. Members of the coalition team halted their tracks as they stood there and watched the rest of the delegates leave the hall. Before leaving, the old man Rinsui approached the still-stunned coalition team and gave a slight bow. I apologize for what happened. Please coordinate with Mr. Yagu in selecting the best place for your delegation to stay here, he informed them. We shall continue this meeting tomorrow. With that said, the old man finally left along with the rest of the government members. Silence filled the whole room once again leaving some of them dumbfounded and puzzled. What the heck just happened? The U.S. representative asked, in a more casual way. In the midst of that silence, Rory gave a little giggle. So it seems they are still protective of it, she remarked, gaining the attention of the rest. Yuji, on the other hand, was lost in his thoughts, glancing at the Prime Minister's eyes as if the elf desperately needed to inform them of important information. It appeared as if he was being forced to close his mouth against his will. That made him wonder what was bothering the minds of these men. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
The woman left and headed downstairs leaving the adventurers a bit dumbfounded. You mean that old geezer with fiery words whom we first met back? Albrecht then said to which his friend. I guess so, but I hope he's not in the mood to curse at people or whatsoever. She remarked, still confused about why would the man be interested in conversing with them. Only one way to find out. X sex 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 sex. It had been an hour past since the meeting with the Quatoin delegates had ended on a very strange and concerning note. Amongst all the meetings that Yuji had attended and documented in this world, this one had to be the most bizarre so far. The kind of tension in the air that took over and the paranoia that filled the old men's faces as they were even more protective of a certain secret. He was more concerned regarding the Prime Minister's current state, the way his own decisions were being forced aside by the old men that were supposedly his advisors, and the fact that he was trying to tell whatever secret that his fellow colleagues were hesitant on revealing. Yuji took a deep breath as he decided to place those thoughts aside for a while. Things were going smoothly as the, the coalition team had finally been relocated to one of the goose houses within the vast courtyards of the palace complex. While the two lieutenants headed to their new HQ and helped with the setups, the young man chose to explore the halls for one more time. He felt as if there were more areas to explore and document, and hopefully, discover something new about the lore of the place. He was the type of person that is often fond of putting the puzzle pieces together, and he wasn't hesitant to begin the journey in this place. His wish would be soon granted upon reaching the last hallways which lead to the final room of the palace which was revealed to be the local chapel. The man's curiosity grew as he proceeded on heading towards the room, though before he could reach the area, he halted his tracks as he suddenly heard loud footsteps followed by a voice calling for a certain name. Princess. A female voice echoed throughout the hallway. Moreover, it came from just behind, and by the time the young rider turned around, he accidentally bumped into the said person. Moments later, he found himself staring at a young brown-haired girl, who almost fell to the ground if not for the latter quickly catching her. Oh, I am really sorry miss, I wasn't looking and he trailed off his words upon seeing the girl's face. He recognized her, and she was the girl who was being escorted along with her friend by the palace guards not so long ago. As for the girl, her short-lived calm face quickly turned into worry as she quickly recovered. Thank you, she said before checking a certain object in her hands to her relief was in one piece. I apologized but I am in hurry right now. She explained, yet the man slightly halted her. Yuji blinked a couple of times before finally asking. Um, is there something that I could help you with? He said, now more interested and concerned about what kind of problem the girl was facing currently. On the other hand, Hamilton really wanted to ask for help right away. Yet she found herself in a situation where there were no guards to talk to directly and the fact that the rest of the Rose Knights were currently at their respective guest houses, from the other side of the palace. Upon seeing this kind and concerned man with whom she accidentally bumped, which somehow encouraged her to finally do so, in the simplest way she could rephrase and summarize, the young lady looked through the man's eyes and pleaded, and my companion has gone missing. Please help me find her. Yuji stared at the young lady, a bit surprised as he tried to make sense of the current situation, and he hoped that this would help her. Okay, I understand. Just please calm down, miss. Hamilton, call me by that name, the girl quickly said. The writer sighed as he continued. Okay, Miss Hamilton. Mind telling me what happened and why did your friend disappear or has wandered off somewhere? He calmly asked. His words somehow have calmed the girl down, and she finally spoke once more. She's just recovering from the bad meeting, and I told her to stay inside the room, to gather herself, while I headed towards our guest house. She explained as the anxiety was still there. Yuji simply nodded. Alright, but does she like being in the room? 
What kind of place does she go to whenever she wants to recuperate? By the time he said those words, to eventually help the young lady recall an imported detail. Ah, uh, well, she usually goes to a, oh no. Hamilton finally realized it. In less than a second, the girl grabbed the man's hand and looked at him straight in the eye. I know this will be a headache, but please follow me for a while. She then said as she dragged the man towards a certain room. Yuji, on the other hand, found himself with no choice but to follow the girl after promising to help her. The only thing that puzzled him right now was why they were ascending to the roof. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
X sex 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 She left the room as soon as the prime minister was in a stable condition. Parna still couldn't believe that a leader like him would sometimes fall under the pressure of the so-called surviving elders, even to the point that they would commit such questionable acts. The elder men were desperately clinging for any relevancy. She couldn't bear being in the same room with them, apart from some of the cabinet members and the prime minister himself, who were humble and kind enough to treat her as a true friend. Yet still, she had not forgotten her purpose and why she was here in the first place. It was this specific part of the palace that had piqued her interest on a consistent basis. She never knew that there was a time when her tribe had their own contributions during the great conflict against the demon invasion. The realization only came to her upon seeing the paintings, illustrations, and even some of the items which had been preserved for many centuries. She was astonished when she learned that the idea of unification didn't happen only once. She always thought her people and race had their own communities and lives. To begin with, rivals and sometimes enemies. Her eyes never left the illustration of a certain warrior bunny that eerily looked like the current beloved queen. In fact, she heard stories of the first great queen of her tribe that fought alongside the alliance of demi-humans and man. The first ever to unite the disgruntled communities in order to save themselves and resist the corruption and inhuman actions of the enemy. It was like repeating history itself, though the only difference was that they were not the victors this time around. Great sorrow quickly filled her eyes remembering her home's last stand, and the unselfish sacrifice of her leader which many believe that the end has come for them. She cried when she saw her again. During the darkest times of her life at Akusho, how she had gone there just to lift her out of the hell she had fallen into. Now she was here, with the chance to restore her home's lost glory, as long as she did her job correctly. By then, her ears lit up as a new presence had arrived at the scene, a shadow looming behind her. It was intimidating yet familiar as if she had witnessed this on the battlefield not long ago. You must be her. A female voice then spoke. She widened her eyes in surprise as she turned to face the new presence. There was intention beneath that warm smile, though she still wasn't sure if it was for good or bad. Nonetheless, she wasn't that clueless to know the person in front of her. The blood-red eyes, the long flowing dark hair, and the recognizable priestess's attire looked more different compared to the last time she saw it. Apostle of Emra. She muttered, giving her a slight glare despite this little fear that grew from within. Rory, on the other hand, continued to smile as she greeted the black-haired warrior bunny. All those times to which Cato had been on suspicion regarding her goals, in fact, she was indeed searching for her. Not to fight or cause any trouble but rather than just talk. The young lady then extended her hand for a shake and said, Care to join me in a conversation? X sex 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 The noble city was indeed magnificent. It was a kind of view that the redhead would rarely get when visiting the city. She had been into the streets, alleyways, and even the tall structures, but not in a spot where she could oversee the entire city in its glory. The wind grew stronger in the midst of a very sunny day. Pina had never felt so much relief when she reached the top part of the palace. The whole area was designed as a public viewing deck for visitors yet was currently undergoing some kind of beautification. Her luck peaked when she found out that she was all alone in the area. A good place for her to clear her mind and just be herself for a while. Being a princess is certainly tough mother. She muttered to herself looking up towards the sky while mentioning a certain loved one. Am I really cursed to be in this position? She added. The doubt was always there ever since that fateful day. There were times that she didn't know what she was fighting for or if there was really a light at the end of the tunnel. She never really had that true rest to begin with. And even her brothers, who were forced into specific roles to which didn't really help them become better. Moreover, 
Her own father wasn't even there to witness horrible changes despite the success that the empire had achieved. Does she even have a father anymore? In her own view, there was no empire, to begin with. It was all nothing but just a dream that had been forcefully created and transformed into a full nightmare. There was no going back to the old days. She was already here and the only thing she could at least do was to eliminate the bad influence and redeem the wrongful actions that her home had committed. At this point in time, another promise was made and she'll make sure that she won't repeat the mistakes again. Oh how she wanted to thank the Prime Minister for his patience and understanding. This was now her second and possibly last chance. In the midst of her thoughts, the bells of the nearby chapel began to ring, followed by the countless flock of birds that flew and passed by her. A smile formed around her lips as Pina stood from the ground and headed towards the edge of the small deck. Overseeing the view of the city again, the young lady drew out a certain object from the small bag that she had brought along. She glanced at the object which was revealed to be that of a small crystal ball and inside reddish cloud-like energy can be seen floating. Well, I guess a little ride in the wind would be all right. She confidently smiled as she threw the small ball of crystal towards the air, though before that, she whispered a certain phrase that eventually triggered the magic inside it. Not too long, Pina finally did the unthinkable as she calmly stepped over the edge and found herself in a graceful fall. She was no longer a stranger to these kinds of stunts as the crystal began to glow, and a white light quickly flashed before her eyes. The glorious cry of an eagle was heard moments later, and when the light faded, the creature is simply known as the griffin emerged from the light and finally summoned to reality. Welcome back, Mara, she smiled. Pina sat on the back of her fellow pet as she encouraged and commanded the creature to fly upwards and back towards the view deck. From there, a shocked and surprised Yuji stood alongside a worried Hamilton, witnessing what had happened, including the princess leaping off the edge of the deck as if she had enough of the world. When the young lady noticed them, she smiled broadly and waved to her companion, who was near to fainting in disbelief. I'll be back. She confidently exclaimed, before flying and heading towards the bay with her pet griffin. Alas, any signs of worry and solemnness were gone and replaced by excitement and courage. She had been longing to do this ever since a certain mage gave her the magical summoning crystal. Finally, she could take a ride and enjoy just being herself for once. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
he then muttered looking away. At the same time, a new presence had entered the scene, as the inn owner greeted the two. So how's the food so far? Anna smiled, curious to know her guest's thoughts. As usual, the boy raised his hand and gave it a thumbs up. This is might be the best meal I've ever had, he then remarked. That old geezer should be the king of cooks in the continent. Anna gave a surprised grin. Oh please don't exaggerate it much, she told the boy. Even though he had the chance to take that crown, he did not choose it since he knew it was not his destiny to be a revered hero after saving the land of the Lucius. She explained. He just wanted to return his home or start a new chapter in life. Both of their curiosities soared as they were now eager to know more about the blonde man. For a man with colorful words, he sure knows how to be humble, Giselle remarked. Oh yes, and to be truthful, without him, my family's restaurant wouldn't last this long, she replied, with a thankful look. It's like he was to answer to our prayers and is sent by the gods. Both the adventurer and apostle gave her an astonished look. It seemed that the story was a little bit exaggerated. What if the Gordon Ramsay character was just a normal man from a normal village that somehow found himself in the right situation? Well, it's a bit too far-fetched for him to be con man or a faker, the boy commented. Of course, he's not, Anna replied, determined to convince the two. Like I said before, Mr. Ramsay is a chef and he's already proven it to you. Another smile emerged. The evidence was right in front of their eyes. Giselle raised an eyebrow. So where does he hail from exactly? She asked. Silence took over for a brief moment. Oh, I think it would be best for him to tell his entire story to you. At that very moment, the doors to the kitchen opened and the man himself emerged in his signature chef attire along with a strong presence that could even scare the toxic customers. Hey, Martin. Make sure that fucking salmon is baked well and served hot this time. It was his temporary last words to one of the chefs inside the kitchen. Gordon Ramsay headed towards the table where the trio was currently located. Good to see you two again. He greeted as he took the vacant seat and sat down. How's the Wellington? He then followed a question. Um, it's really delicious, sir. I mean Chef Ramsay, Albrecht said, still getting used to talking to the man. The blonde man slightly chuckled. Enough with chef or sir, you can just call me Gordon or Uncle Gordon, he then suggested. Seeing the man in this kind of laid-back state was certainly surprising for the two. Uncle Gordon, both Giselle and Albrecht said in unison. The man chuckled again as he fondly recalled an orange friend, who popularized that nickname, and he was sure that everyone in this world would not get the reference. He cleared his throat as he decided to get to the main topic. All right then. So adventurer boy and dragon girl, I would really like to ask you both for a small favor. He asked, eyeing the two, if it's okay with you. Both of them simply nodded understanding, although we're pretty curious regarding the man's plans. Well, since tomorrow would be the city celebrations, we have decided to set up a booth at the heart of the festival he explained. Though we are certainly short of crew members to take on the job, and they might need a couple of people to assist them. The man paused as he let the two absorb the information. So who's gonna be at the festival? Albrecht then asked. Well, Selina would be going along with Wolfman over there. He pointed towards the two crew members, who were busy entertaining the customers. But what about our own mission? Giselle interrupted as she raised an eyebrow. It's our first priority, for your information, sir. Gordon Ramsay then sighed. Just help them set up the booth, advertise to attract more customers, and then you can all finally focus on whatever mission you have there. Besides, you told me that you want to infiltrate that stupid circus with all those weird fantasy creatures for show, the man said before giving a confident smirk. Do me another favor and deliver these orders to the big boy circus wankers tomorrow. They got no choice but to let you guys in. He chuckled. Giselle and Albrecht's eyes widened in surprise, as they had not expected the man to give them such easy access. 
and it was indeed a clever plan from the beginning. So what do you think? Gordon moved his eyebrows and grinned. Are you guys in for the ride? It was an offer that they could possibly deem as a blessing, and in less than seconds, both of them took glances at each other before giving a confident smile to the man. Count us in Uncle Gordon. Chapter End And great to see you once again guys. That's a wrap for this chapter and I am so grateful that I was able to complete it despite my busy real life schedule. Whenever I had the free time, I would use that available time to write the scenes. Also would like to thank fellow readers and authors for their tips and advice. I appreciate your support for the story. Anyways, regarding the chapter, as usual, it's pretty close and personal. The setting and places mainly focused on the palace complex, the lonely lamb inn, and city streets. I also felt that it was probably the right time to get on with the negotiations for the diplomacy scene. Two groups, Team Pina and Team Coalition, aimed to capture the Quatoin officials' hearts and finally convince them of their claims. I did my best to make it simple and not too complex, and I have to find a way where both sides at least achieve something. At the same time, Tuka, Rory, and Lele finally continue on with their own goals in the city. The main lore of the Ark is now unfolding starting with the secret that the advisors from the defunct Elven Council tried to hide and protect. And in the next chapters would introduce the second part of the lore which will involve the Dragon Ark. Even though Quatoin is still spared from any full-on violence and invasion, it also planted the seeds of paranoia amongst the ones in charge, as they basically isolated themselves and are now much more dependent on a waning blessing of a forgotten god. The characters, Diplomat Tanaka, Yagu, and Minsui from OGNHS finally make their debut. As for the American representative, Diplomat Diane Kelly is an OC and is pretty much different from the representative Kelly of Freedom's Ring. I took most of DFM's advice in fleshing out their characters such as making the Japanese representative more polite and laid back, while his USA counterpart was more shy, calm, and serious looking. I kind of felt it was fitting for them to get to know Rory and make friends with her. For Prime Minister Kanada, his original personality of being a forgiving and understanding person remains. Yagu being the friendly guy he is and Rinsui being the more skeptical one. For Pina, I kinda envision her adventurous side to be like this. A strong girl with high hopes even in the midst of her struggles. Gordon Ramsay being Gordon Ramsay. And him having a role in the story helping team Giselle. And to also inform that the whole arc would possibly be longer than the previous arc due to some scenes and perspectives that might need chapters of their own. With that said, thank you very much for spending time to read the chapter. I really appreciate it. I apologize for any grammar slash spelling mistakes since English is not my main language. Thank you so much and best wishes. 15. Arc 2. Noble City I.S. Perspectives. Disclaimer. I don't own Gate or Nyankoku Shokan as it belongs to its rightful owners. Arc 2. A City. A Diplomacy A Dragon. Noble City I.S. Perspectives. The hymn began after the bells rang, and a choir stood in the middle of the crossing, delivering the song as the sun beamed down on them. The attendants of the church began to sing along, while some stayed silent and kept praying. With the wind you go. Still, I dream of your spirit leading you back home. I will give my gifts to you. Grow your garden, watch it bloom. As man, elf, and demi-human raise their faiths and spirits to the goddess, the blessing inside the room swelled and spread. The light in your eyes is an angel up high, fighting to ease the shadow side. Hearts will grow though having to bend, leaving behind all things in the end. Memories of a forgotten time resurfaced, the more the people called out to the higher beings that gave a blessing to the land they resided. Moreover, that the promise was still kept and the lands of Quatoin were untouched. Listen to my voice calling you, pulling you out of the darkness. Hear their cries and remember the day it happened, for this land will remain in peace and enlightened. 
Scores of applause then filled the entire cathedral as all the attendants expressed their joy and devotion to gods once again. Furthermore, the performance by the choir was also received with applause from the crowd. Yet another day of peace has reigned upon the land. After the song ended, the old high priest walked up to the stands, raising his wooden staff in the air, and the crowd bowed down and prayed once more. I thank you all for coming today, and as we gather once more to bring glory to our ancestors and the gods. The man declared confidently, from this day forward, the entire land will be celebrating the thousand-year peace that men, elf, dwarves, and beastkins alike had achieved. That spirit to which we still have today must never be forgotten, and by the blessing of the goddess, we will continue to raise it above. The crowd reacted with little bits of agreement and cheers as they let themselves be immersed by the surroundings. Many had said that our land is the weakest and most vulnerable to invasions, but I disagree as, during the tribulation of the Ravernals and Demon God, we were hailed as the last bastion of hope, and thousand years later we are still here. The old man then exclaimed, It is because that we have the full blessing of the gods, and unlike the other nations, we continue to raise our faiths on them. He then raised his hand as if he was calling to fate itself. Whatever trials we, the people of Kwatoin, are currently facing, we will overcome them, and no empire or demon will be able to stop us. Long live Kwatoin and the gods. The crowd stood up and they began to lift their hands as they continued to rally and uplift their morality and faith. Unbeknownst to them that the next trial is creeping up to the land as another day had passed. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
As expected, silence greeted her once she entered the large thick wooden doors and found herself inside the oldest library in Kwatwin. Her eyes began to move as she observed her current surroundings. The interior of the place was massive, with its roofs reaching as high as the tallest structures in the city, the main area which was in a dome-like formation, and the countless books, tomes, and scrolls displayed on the many the shelves scattered around the place. They were really not kidding when they said to not get overwhelmed. Hitoshi had remarked as quietly as he could, feeling like a befuddled but inquisitive child in a museum. The young man could say the same for his fellow recon member. He found himself inside an ancient library with books that contain important information that dates back thousands of years. The place was currently filled with a few scholars, teachers, and students, looking to enhance their knowledge or make new historical discoveries. Say Miss Lele, how are you going to find the information you've been looking for here? The man had asked, a bit concerned regarding the young teen's goal. The young lady simply nodded in silence, her confidence soaring despite the challenge of making the most of the time she had. She then turned her gaze to the upper floors, recalling her grandfather's words. As she muttered, a faint but confident smile formed around her lips. I think I know. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
but it is part of our mission to ensure their safety and that these people never have to experience any violence or destruction ever again, he explained with a hint of determination in his voice. I've never given up hope until now. His statement left the others at a loss for words, including Shino, who gave him an understanding expression, prompting her to recall the previous incident at Kota Village. The realization would soon emerge, learning that they had survived that ordeal all because they had never given up hope, though applying this to the larger picture would be a challenge. Tuka had heard everything, including the young otaku's statement, which she thought was very helpful to her worried mind. Whoever thought the person she previously thought was a strange man was the one to actually lift everyone's spirits throughout the journey. And in the midst of all of this, the group had finally arrived at its destination. The scenery had changed, and the LAV had arrived at a location where a small stone bridge leading to a gate was located, after passing through bustling, noisy city streets. A stone gate with a distinct triangular design on top, and a part of the massive thick grey marala wall surrounded by a moat and floating grass. A number of open wagons and carriages drawn by chocobos and horses were also seen crossing the bridge and entering the stone gate. The majority of these carriages were filled with furniture, wooden crates, and bags belonging to people who didn't seem to belong there in the first place. Looks like we're here fellas, Karada said to the group before continuing to examine the ancient looking gate and noticing the sign embedded in the middle. Though he could identify the letters and attempt to read the name, the man knew his understanding of the written language in this world was still abysmal. Puerto Parian? Sounds a little Spanish to me, he remarked as he drove and followed the guide through the gate. By the end, Everyone could see more structures in the form of large adobe cube-like houses located between the narrow streets. There were some similarities with shop houses in city districts, but the difference was that the buildings had larger and wider windows, and the designs were more elegant in some ways, and they were built in a wall-to-wall -wall style. Higashi raised both eyebrows as he looked at the young woman. Um, Shino. Any additional details about the place we're about to enter? Well, not entirely sure about the exact history of the place, but according to what the guide had said earlier, this place is a walled city but smaller, she explained, causing the others to raise all eyebrows in surprise. My Hark, which is also a walled city, contains another walled city. How bizarre and absurd was that? The young man couldn't believe what he just found out. When he looked out the window once more, he noticed that there were fewer people than in the main district. Furthermore, many of the buildings appeared to have been abandoned or decaying for an extended period of time. There were also a few shops strewn about the small walled city that was barely crowded. The best explanation he could think of was that noon was approaching and the clouds had given the sun the rains to spread the heat throughout. They would soon begin to wonder about the location of the refugee camp or town that the local authorities were informing them about. However, by the time they reached a certain part of the walled city, their doubts would have surfaced. A square-shaped plaza could be seen in the heart of the walled town, surrounded by magnificent structures such as a cathedral to the north, a white Baroque-style palace to the west and a vacant lot to the east where ruins or remnants of a similar palace can be found. In the center of the plaza, there was a small monument that was surrounded and planted by numerous wooden poles carrying flags with various symbols and representations. An official from the walled town's governing body stood near the monument, waiting for the new visitors. The LAV came to a stop right next to the plaza and the group was greeted by the slightly humid weather as they disembarked. The official, who turned out to be an elf of origin, smiled as he was the first to approach the men in green, about whom he had been informed prior to their arrival. He, like the rest of his colleagues, was mesmerized by their overall appearance and the iron horseless carriage that they arrived in. There were four of them in total, two human men, a woman, and the other, whom he had failed to recognize because the person was hidden behind them. 
Nonetheless, the elf official smiled, saying, Greetings, men in green. Welcome to the small walled community of Muro. My name is Daryl, and I represent the local council that governs this place. He then introduced himself and was greeted with a slew of smiles. Higashi was the first to speak up, assuming the role of unofficial representative for his team. It's a pleasure to meet you, sir, he said as he shook hands with the elf. I guess you're pretty much aware of why we're here, he added. Oh yes, I was immediately notified of your visit, and correct me if I'm wrong, you're all going to the refugee town, he inquired. That's exactly correct, sir. Though, we've been really wondering about the exact location of the town, the young man informed the official, taking a moment to look around his surroundings. I mean, the whole place looks like your average village or community. Daryl simply smiled, sensing their confusion as he was ready to tell them the history of the walled city in the simplest way he could. Well, this entire community is where Quatoin's nobles used to reside, he explained, simply trying to point to the sizable colonial-looking houses. Every structure you've come to pass by are the old mansions that they used to own, he added. Some became dilapidated, and some were blessed enough to survive for years. His statement greatly surprised the group. Wait, so you mean this place is a haven for the wealthy and successful? Karada couldn't help but ask for details. The elf official simply nodded. Yes, at least that was its former purpose, he replied. Since the noble families left for a new land at St. Anna, this place is nothing more than an empty shell. Almost, he explained again. These days, due to the conflict in the neighboring borders, the principality has been using the walled town as a new place to shelter the villagers who have been displaced and have lost their homes as a result of the fighting. Therefore, by order of the prime minister that the walled town of Muro would be converted into a refugee town and a possibly a new home for them. He finished his sentence, completing his small history lesson. Another revelation would then soon strike the group and their doubts finally been confirmed. Damn. So all those villagers got to live in these mansions, Karada remarked. That's some really good karma, he added, causing Shino to roll both her eyes. The elf official then raised his hand, drawing the rest of the villagers' attention back to him. Now if I may ask, to which group of villagers do you seek and why? He elaborated, clearing up his doubts. There was a brief moment of silence before the young woman cleared her throat. Well, we're on a special mission to find a group of villagers from a place called Koan, she explained. Apparently, one of our leads told us that when the village was destroyed, the surviving villagers migrated to Kwatoin. The official nodded, impressed that they had guessed some of the information correctly. We do have villagers here who came from the north, especially the wood elves, he explained. May I ask, which one of you is looking for that specific group? The trio had stepped aside at this point, and a blonde elf girl emerged from behind them. Despite her internal anxiety, she maintained her hopeful demeanor. I am, she simply stated, holding what appeared to be a small wooden badge given to her by her father, and bearing her home's signature symbol. My name is Tukaluna Marso, and I am from the village of Koan, she introduced herself and further explained. Looking the elf official in the eyes with all seriousness and determination, Daryl's eyes widened in surprise as he was placed in a temporary state of disbelief, having only recently learned the news. The official couldn't believe that another survivor from that specific village had shown up. As for Tuka, she attempted to read the elf's expression, as it turned from shock to solemn which slightly surprised her. Regardless, she spoke again. Please, sir, I've been searching for my relatives and friends for many weeks now, she explained. I want to see them again. She pleaded with him, expressing that certain desire. She remembered the last time she saw him and the image of the villagers heading towards the sunset. The rest of the recon members remained silent, as they, too, were swept up in the excitement and wished the best for the elf girl. The elf official, on the other hand, 
remained silent as he struggled to explain what had happened during those crucial weeks of migration. He cast a quick glance in one direction before returning his gaze to them. A part of him had decided that it was best to show her the villager's current state. So he faintly muttered, Please follow me. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
She remained calmed and directed her focus toward the messenger. She simply nodded. Thank you for informing, but may I ask, what's this all about? She followed a question. The messenger found himself in a bit of a bind as he tried to summarize the information he was about to deliver. Or perhaps exhaustion had caught up with him with all the running. He also has no idea how the others will react. Regardless, he gathered his thoughts and spoke. The J garrison has sent an urgent message requesting immediate reinforcements. X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X Parna couldn't get over the silence that filled the entire room. The young woman felt this restlessness as she leaned on the cold wall, with her hands behind her back, while observing the strange and solemn scene in front of her. It was as if being in some kind of wake. The mournful like faces of several officials, who were mostly composed of the members of the former council. Only Rinsui and General Hankey who were from the Prime Minister's cabinet body, are present and are accompanied by a couple of palace guards. Instead of having the same mournful and calm expressions as the previous council members, the two men, particularly Rinsui, were filled with pity, regret, and rage. It wasn't really a wake or funeral because the prime minister was in a stable condition but was in a deep slumber on a certain bed. After collapsing during the previous meeting with the delegates from the so-called other realm, Parna, for her part, felt sympathy for the young prime minister. She wasn't sure why she had to witness the elf forcefully having to endure the unfair consequences that he didn't even deserve from the beginning.